it's good to see the planning board members. We've we're now we're getting to know each other. So I'm enjoying this, and mm -hmm. I'm grateful for your uh, your counsel. And uh, just to give you an idea how much I really like this, we're going to schedule another one of these actually for some more zoning that's looming, and we'll the we'll you'll be apprised of that soon enough. Um, so I'm um, Bill Dwight, I'm a city councilor at large. I'm also the chair of legislative matters. As I said, I pulled the short straw this time. George Kohau did it last time. We're trading off back and forth as to who will be presiding. Um, tonight's meeting is a little different than the last meeting that we held, which was actually in, in embodied essentially a, well, not essentially, actually a, a hearing, a public hearing, which is, <clears throat> which is structured differently than the way this is. This is a deliberative discussion with the, most, with the members of both the planning board and uh, the, uh, the city council legislative matters committee. And the, for the purposes of making a recommendation or multiple recommendations on these proposed ordinance changes that we have before us. And the reason we call this meeting, and this is somewhat extraordinary, but we call this meeting because of the uh, breadth and depth of these um, zoning so that we would be having more fully informed opinion as we render our decisions and, and move forward in debate. Here's the process for the public to follow, just so you know. Um, we're gonna, I'm, in a moment, I'm gonna open the meeting. Um, the public comment will be preceded, we're asking um, people who have comments to keep in mind, and that is so that will be the point at which the public will be able to participate is by public comment. But it is our it is the rules of the council, not and since we're the the body here that's basically hosting, we'll stick with those rules. Um, it's not deliberative, more or less. The fact is that you won't the you can uh, offer new information. You can even ask questions, but more or less what we prefer to do is not answer um, people when they question us directly. But in these type of situations, um, we can make an allowance because the purpose of this, as I said, is, is for a greater understanding for a recommendation. But I would ask you to uh, consider if you're speaking, if you spoke before uh, and you have new information to impart, please share that. If, if not, please, consider the fact that this is likely to queue up to be a long meeting and also people have we want to give everyone an opportunity to speak if someone has said something that you agree with and that you don't have anything necessarily to add to it um we can recognize you you can say ditto or amen or whatever um please don't if you're inclined please don't repeat what was already said because um as i said in the interest of time here, we want to make this work and we do have work to do. So one, and here's the other thing. This is at the end of this meeting, there will be two votes. Uh, the two bodies will vote for recommendations. Um, now, if they both forward positive recommendations, that goes to the council where these items will be introduced at a council meeting um, with the recommendations. Uh, the council is not bound to abide by the recommendations. The council also has the authority to amend uh, and they would deliberate and vote. Another opportunity there for the public to speak at that meeting. And because Northampton is unique and we are unique in this respect, we vote for it twice. We don't vote, we vote once and then we wait until the <laughs> next meeting, which is usually two weeks later to vote again to reaffirm our vote. Um, no other deliberative body in the state, as far as I know, does this, but we do. And actually it's, it's actually, it's pretty good by my reckoning. We haven't gotten rid of it because it actually does give us an opportunity to be pretty firm in our understanding and commitment to issues as we vote on them. All right, so that said, we'll start off um, with the announcement that this will be recorded, is it being recorded? Is some is yes, more? it okay. is. All right. So, Bill, Bill, excuse me. Can I ask a question on procedure? Sure, Alan. Yeah. Uh, 
is this an all or nothing vote on the ordinance that's proposed? No, the because based on the recommendations, of course, we have we have essentially three options: uh, uh, recommend or neutral vote, essentially, um, which might reflect a division, uh, even division, or a negative vote um, to forward to the council. That's what our body does. The planning board we usually look toward we look for positive recommendations coming out of the planning board, in, in so far as that's your area of expertise. Well, so, is there such a thing as approving it, but modifying any one provision? Yes. 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 Oh, all right. Yes. Thank that's, you. That's, that's, that's what legislative matters does. We, we can amend. You can even, I mean, we have, uh, what, 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 we have what, how many items do we have? They can come separately or as a package or they can be uh, items can be pulled out can be modified and so on so okay uh yeah so for the in the interest of full and, and full um, disclosure we also ask if you're going to uh participate you will be recorded if you don't want your image recorded, turn off your camera and we can record the audio as far as that goes. But um, the proceedings will follow by uh, being, I will recognize you as your hand pops up. And uh, we ask that you comport yourself with the, the decorum that's, that was most appropriate. <laughs> and, and actually, I haven't seen anyone do anything else but so but just so you know that if if we feel if i feel that you're out of order by uh defaming someone by being uh by employing language that wouldn't be uh, conducive to a tempered discussion then i reserve the right to actually mute you and shut you off from the meeting i mean you're allowed to continue to watch but you're no longer allowed to participate Okay, that said, um, so let's open this up to public comment. That's and cool. Can I just say something yeah. super quick? Um, the way that it's set up right now, it, um, the chat function will only work to Laura. So if people are having trouble raising their hands, Laura, I don't know if you're able to keep an eye on that. If you don't feel like you can keep an eye on that and you want to throw it to me, I can monitor whether people are trying to say that. That would be great if you're willing. Let's see. Uh, here we go. And I add one other question. Is there um, a block of time, like uh, 15 minutes, half hour of the first part of the meeting for public comment on anything? Or is this well, um, in the, in wide the, open? Yeah, in, the, in public comment in the city council, it's wide open. In this case, this because it's a joint meeting and, there, and because of what we're working on, I want to keep the public comment to a half an hour. Um, so... I'm sorry. Thank you for asking me that. That was my plan. And um, we'll see how it goes. The, uh, if you want to speak, raise your hand. I see a couple of people have already, uh, Sue Lofthouse and Jackie Ballant have uh, employed the raised hand feature. If you, it differs on everyone's machine and depending on which version of the software you've uploaded for Zoom. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Councilor Shara, you, I think you have this committed to heart. What what is the process by which someone can raise their hand? It's either uh, either you click on the participants button at the bottom of the screen, which will open up a panel, and at the at the bottom of that panel, which is usually to your right, there should be a raise hand feature. Or um, depending on whether you've upgraded your Zoom, it's under reactions now, which is also in that bottom kind of banner at the at the bottom of the Zoom screen. So if you click on reactions, you should be, you should see raise hand in there if you don't see it under participants. And if you're on an iPad, it's in the upper right hand corner, of course, because why would it be in the same place? And on your phone, it's in an even different place. Um, you also can simply raise your hand like this too, and we'll we'll scroll through all the participants. Jackie, you were up first. Thank you for your patience. Um, you're muted. Can we unmute Jackie? Sorry, uh, hold on. Sorry, I'm, there you go. 
Good work now, Jackie. I'm Keep it. There. there you go. Okay, Jackie Balance, 35 Warner Street. Uh, tonight, I want to speak very briefly about the ordinance relative to demolition review for historically significant buildings. It's at the end of tonight's agenda. I spoke uh, to the Historical Commission about this matter when they voted on it recently with a request that the city be required to notify abutters whenever a demolition permit is applied for in a residential area. Everyone I've spoken with since then, 100% agree that it seems like a common courtesy to let folks know about big changes like a demolition next door. Who among us would not want to be notified if someone had a plan to demolish a house close to our own. Demolition might be good news. If it's an eyesore and a danger, it might be bad news. But either way, it seems that neighbors have a right to know when something is coming up as a momentous as a demolition. I spoke with another city councilor today, uh, someone who's not on this committee of legislative matters. And uh, that person told me, they said, they thought you all might be in agreement with such a reasonable request to notify abutters in a timely fashion when a demolition permit is applied for and to make it an amendment to this administrative ordinance matter that's coming up later. And in fact, still another city councilor told me that they thought neighbors were already notified of a demolition permit application, but that is not the case. I hope you can address this in tonight's discussion. I hope it will be a favorable discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Deborah, you're next. Hi, I actually think Susan was before me. Well, Sue's actually, Susan, um, yes, you had your hand up and then you took, oh yeah, I'm sorry, your hand is up still. I'm sorry, it's hidden in your books. Uh, Sue Lofthouse, you're next. Thank you, Deborah. Hi, everybody. My name's Sue Lofthouse. I'm at 15 Stoddard Street, and um, here as a resident and also as a member of the Urban Forestry Commission. Our commission um, has submitted a letter to this committee's meeting for your record, and um, I will read part of that letter and um, ask you to read the whole, in the interest of time, I won't read the whole thing, but I wanted to show up and uh, make sure you all know that's there. And um, basically the Northampton, this, so this part's the actual on behalf of the commission, Northampton's seven member urban forestry commission endorses the goal of affordable housing, but we unanimously oppose the two family by right amendments in their current form. If enacted, these amendments would likely have detrimental impact to our, on our urban forest. Most trees in the city are on private property will be affected by these relaxed restrictions. And I'll skip off the letter for a moment and um, focus on the fact that I believe that any two family buy right package ought to reference the significant tree ordinance language um, for operational execution, particularly specifically the detailed language relating to tree replacements and mitigation is missing. Um, personally, as a member of the commission, um, I couldn't support it um, because um, parts of it, I don't understand how that will work. There's no specifics about tree replacements. So there's language about that, which is great. We love planting trees. And, um, but we do have a list of technical and operational needs that are open and many questions um, for the, about the tree language. And um, I'll go back to the letter for just a moment and um, go back to it, but you can refer to the whole thing. Because the pandemic has interfered with usual procedures, the U Urban Forestry Commission was not involved in drafting these proposed amendments and did not give input prior to their public presentation. We therefore respectfully request a referral of the proposed two family by right amendments to this commission so we have the opportunity for an appropriate review and comment prior to submission of this package for a vote. We would greatly appreciate the ability to work with the Office of Planning and Sustainability on a package of zoning changes that strikes a balance between the goal of affordable housing and the value of preserving our trees. The UFC strongly believes that the goal of affordable housing can be reconciled 
with the goal of preserving our tree canopy. The city's trees mitigate stormwater runoff, cool the city during hot summers and sequester carbon. They're integral to the city's goal of achieving carbon neutrality by 2050. As importantly, they further create our sense of place. Reconciling these goals will take some work. We're eager, eager to do this work, but a referral to our commission is needed. So basically, um, due to the pandemic and other things, so I read portions of the letter, please refer to it. And um, thank you very much for your careful consideration. Thank you. Deborah, now you may speak, how's that? Thank you, hello everybody. Um, <clears throat> I wanna address two things on the agenda tonight. One is, um, I, I unfortunately missed the historic committee meeting about why the last part is being removed. But I want to second what Jackie, um, I'm sorry, I live at 41 Warner Street, Deborah Berkovitz. Um, the, um, as people know, the city records, um, for the most part, don't date houses before 1900. And so it requires generally a significant amount of research to actually know what people are looking at. And I think I wrote an email to Carolyn Mish and some others last week that a number of you got. And the response that I got from Carolyn misunderstood what I was saying. Not that I believe that the number of people should who attend uh, a, a historic commission meeting about a demolition application should impact the decision, but rather that when members of the public are invested um, in a demolition application, they're, they're often able and willing to get more information about the historic nature of the, of the building in question. And what's happened is that um, people don't know about it. So they only find out when the building, when the permit has already been granted, when a building is being demolished. And given the fact that in the city, if people are applying for variance, zoning variance, it can be very minor. Um, in terms of the impact on a neighborhood and all the abutters need to be notified. This seems like a pretty significant oversight. So I think, especially with that, um, the language being struck in the last section of the, the for the historic commission tonight, um, we don't actually have any comprehensive record of, um, of, of any, actually the properties in the city, uh, you know, until we have a form B's on every single building in the city, we, we don't know until somebody's willing to do the research. And I think members of the public would be um, happy to assist the historic commission with that. And then secondarily, I don't know how to articulate this well, so I'm just gonna put it on the record and, and forgive me. Um, I'm very supportive of, of affordable housing. I understand the goals of the city I learned today that there's going to be another project like the other ones in Bay State, which many people have heard me complaining about. Um, and so it was upsetting to hear we were going to get yet three more houses at least on another property. And um, my concern is that this addition, particularly about the addition of this, this the possible second house behind, that even though there's going to be another level of review for that, that, that it's not going to be by right. Um, the, the potential density of that in our neighborhoods when we're already seeing the effects of the zero lot lines and the smaller house lots um, is just incredibly concerning to me because so far what's been pretty clear is that the planning department is very invested in, dense, in, in the density of housing and so without, um, I don't feel confident as, as a resident that decisions are going to be made to not always grant that second house so in you know, a single, when I look at the, the, the properties near us that are getting developed, one can become six, one house can become six um, very quickly. And that's really concerning to me. And so I think until we have some of the other zoning stuff worked out in, in terms of re-looking at the zero lot lines, um, re-looking at the changes in the, in the house, um, in the lot size, and also without adequate design standards, I'm I'm objecting to this kind of like the the scale of of the of what's possible. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and actually, Deborah reminded me. Of course, when you speak, please give your name and the town you live in. You don't have to give your address. Uh, Kristen Sykes, you're up next. <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you very much, Kristen Sykes. I live in Bay State Village in Florence, but am um, soon moving to Holyoke, Massachusetts. And I wanted to speak in favor of the two family by right 
Um, I lived in Nursing for uh, five and a half years and um, have needed to find a new place to live. I'm very committed to Northampton. My husband and I have a business in Northampton. Um, I'm active in lots of activism and support local downtown businesses. But due to the immense shortage in Northampton and in Florence, um, and I know that this has been accelerated by the pandemic, I, would, I really would love to see more opportunities for folks to be able to continue to live in Northampton and in Florence. Um, I'm excited about living in Holyoke as well and contributing, but um, I think there's a real need, especially for those in a lower income bracket, um, to be able to stay in Northampton and Florence. Um, and I also believe that, you know, Northampton is uh, benefited and um, has the diversity of all the folks who are able to live here. So just wanted to speak in favor of that. And I thank um, Councillor Jarrett in particular for his advocacy on this effort. Thank you very much. Uh, Reyes Lozaro, you're next. Thank you very much. I briefly want to speak in support of what, sorry, I live on 172 Federal Street in Bay State. I want to support strongly what Jackie Balance said about um, doing a better job of notifying abutters. As someone who lives across from a big construction site that may involve further demolition, I can tell you that the lack of notification was pretty damaging and it made me feel abandoned by my local authorities. I've always paid my taxes with excitement. No, I pay them because it is the law that has to do with democracy. Um, just, you know, a better job about notifying abutters. I've been told that it used to be what was done. I don't know when it changed. Um, but in my own experience, again, I was totally unnotified, but for 10 days before a meeting was happening at town hall for some kind of request. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, let's see, Bill Ryan, you're next. And then following that will be uh, Bucky Sparkle. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Uh, I'm Bill Ryan. I live in uh, Florence, and um, and I've sent you a long email today, so I'll speak very shortly. Uh, I, I have a concern about the zero lot line uh, use with the new two families on a single lot uh, provision of the uh, amendments, and um, I'd like I, I don't know that the language that I suggested is actually the correct language. I, I put it in the uh, the use by right. And I think maybe that kind of language should probably be in the site plan aspect where uh, the site plan approval for two single family dwellings per lot is, um, is established. So, but, um, but uh, if you get a chance, please read my email and, uh, and uh, you'll see the reason for my concern. And I hope that you'll very carefully consider how to go forward with this uh, two family on the single lot uh, uh, set of problems because I think it raises, as Deborah said, a, a unique set of problems that really need to be uh, considered very carefully before this is passed. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Bucky Sparkle. All right. Hi. Um, my name is Bucky Sparkle and I'm a resident of Leeds on Grove Avenue. And I just want to throw my two cents in and uh, reiterate support for the two family by right zoning bylaws. Um, I'm a civil engineer, been practicing as such in many municipalities in Massachusetts for decades. And I have seen firsthand what happens to uh, our environment when we go into the woods, we go into the farmlands, what happens to the DPW when we extend our roads, we extend our water main and sewer services uh, and additional um, infrastructure uh, headaches and obligations that go in perpetuity. So I am a big <coughs> fan of the concept of infill development, of working with uh, already relatively urban areas compared to the woods uh, and trying to you know, concentrate our human impact in areas that are already impacted. Um, I am also a fan of you know, being mindful, trying to control this, trying to manage it, not have it be too big 
for any one location. And I know those are a lot of issues that other people are uh, passionate about. So I'll kind of leave it to others to chime in there. So just in short, I'm, I'm for the process that the city seems to be moving toward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Randy Saylor, please. Yeah, I'd like to speak in support of the bylaw as well. Uh, I'll agree with what uh, Bucky was just saying in terms of um, adding density to the community. It's an easy way to add density and add housing with little or no infrastructure that needs to really additional infrastructure like roads or sewers that need to be maintained by um, the town. Um, and I think that's a good thing. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm sorry, can I ask you to actually officially oh, state your name and yeah. address? My name is Randy Saylor and I live in Florence. Thank you so much. Uh, I have you down as Johnny Senior or Johnny SR. You're next. Yes, Johnny Scarborough, Florence, Mass. And I will tend to agree with uh, Deborah on what she was saying. Having lived in other areas in Massachusetts where this kind of infill process has taken place, um, I have seen detriment to the neighborhoods as they currently exist. Um, it it uh, changes everything greatly. Um, where you had backyards that were nice, all of a sudden you now have big houses closer and closer together. And if you like to live in Cambridge or something like that, then that's what you will end up with. Um, thank you, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Um, let's see, anyone else? I don't see any other hands here. Um, Going once, going twice. All right. Um, Laura, would you please call the roll of the two bodies? Uh, you're muted, Laura, I'm sorry. Thank you. you um, Councillor Dwight. Here. Councillor Shara. <laughs> I think I heard her say here. Here, sorry. <laughs> Councillor Thorpe. Here. And Councillor Mayori. Here. And I do have a list of the planning board members if you'd like me to try to call that roll. Um, sure, uh, for, first, or, let me announce that we have a quorum of the legislative matters body and therefore we can convene and Laura be my guest, go for it. Okay. Member Kohout. Here. Member Elkins. Here. Member Fowler. Member Granat. Here. Member Taylor. Don't hear anything, so absent, I'm assuming. Member Tate. Here. Member Verson. Here. Member White. Here. And Member Whitehill. Here. I hope that was everybody. That was nice. All right. All right, we have a quorum of both bodies, so um, we can open first um, for for the legislative matters committee to consider. We have to have a, a, a motion for approval of the minutes of last meeting. Motion for approval. Motions been made. And, okay, motions been made by Councilor Thorpe and seconded by Council Maori. Uh, discussion on the minutes. Or would you please call the roll? Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Mayori. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and let's see. Also, well, Laura, do we also have the minutes of the Joint Planning Board? The unfortunately the not. Um, okay. Then then we won't vote on those. How's that? I'm sure everyone's pretty crushed by that prospect, and I'm sorry. All right. Now we're in it. <laughs> now we wade into it. And as you recall, um, essentially, this is this was a request from the Legislative Matters Committee because, as I said, um, uh, we were deferring to our uh, more learned colleagues in the planning <coughs> uh, on the planning board. And um, 
we were we were probably we were, because the hearing lasted so long, we were really late into it, and we did, and you guys still had more meeting to do, so we thought that we would just continue that discussion today. Um, I would actually like to start by recognizing Carolyn Mish because there's some modifications that she's proposing uh, that were subsequent to the last meeting. So, Carolyn, would you you have the floor? Sure, thank you. Um, so uh, when the committees met um, last month, um, at the time there had been some public comment about different issues and uh, there had been some input about potential modifications as well as uh, issues related to uh, whether or not the zoning could dictate particular building code requirements uh, with uh, by right uh, projects that didn't require any additional planning board or zoning board or other committee review. So in the intervening time between the meetings, I put together some modifications that would address those public comments and also uh, sort of sort out the, the issues related to the site plan versus the straight building permit by right um, process for the two family. And the first item, so this is labeled as ordinance two of 10 or 20.164, uh, which relates to modifications to the urban residential A district. Um, the, uh, the modific modified ordinance uh, from the one that was originally um, introduced to city council would scratch the um, provision under um, uses allowed by right for two family uh, less than 3,400 square feet and just um, have a, a line item in uses allowed by site plan to be two single family dwellings per lot or two family um, would trigger site plan review. So that's um, a change to 164 and a changes to 165 relate to urban residential B and urban residential C. Um, also striking the same language related to differentiating between two families less than 3,400 square feet total. Um, as originally the idea was that there would be a little bit of an incentive to build a smaller two family if it didn't trigger site plan review, which is um, triggered with any construction over 2000 square feet. So again, in the URB and C districts where two families are already allowed by right, except once it gets to that 2000 square foot threshold. Um, uh, so strike the differentiation in B and C related to 3400 square feet and just, um, uh, trigger site plan for two family when there's two single units on a lot. So two units per lot would trigger the site plan in B and C. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, the other thing I failed to mention on URA was that there was still a, a hanging reference to accessory dwelling units in a detached form and attached form. And since the whole idea about this package is to replace the concept of accessory dwelling units, uh, we need to make sure that it's clear in your adoption and also to general code that the language for accessory dwellings would be eliminated throughout the entire ordinance. So that's another change in um, throughout these. Um, moving to 20.166, which is ordinances, ordinance four of 10. Um, again, adding text in a um, general standards one, um, A1 to state that for two new two families or two single families on a lot, that trigger site plan must be fossil fuel free. And that again speaks to the um, issue that's yet under, 
um, it's safer to say that the planning board has jurisdiction to require an element that would otherwise be dictated or, or under the jurisdiction of the building code. But so long as it's in planning board review, then the planning board could require that. Um, that's that subsection. Also in the that section on under C, uh, there was a concern about existing conditions where you have a single family unit and you want to add a second unit. So I the recommendation is to add a line under the in the table under the um, line that's um, the, the, in the diagram related to C, the build to zone. Um, add, a te add text that says that's not applicable for additions to existing structures that do not meet this criteria. So if your existing house is not in the build to zone, you don't then have to add a second unit that's in the build to zone. Carolyn, can I ask you a really quick question about that that table and that diagram? Sure. Diagram C, because I just see there's um, letters E and F are represented in the diagram and they're not on the table. Yep. So I'm just wondering, do we need to add them to the table? Do we need to remove them from the diagram? Um, if, since that section isn't related to those, um, uh, parts of the diagram, we can certainly delete the references and keep the table the same. Okay. Um, and just clean up the graphic if that makes it cleaner. Um, okay, so I, that's it for the changes in 166. Um, moving on to 167. Um, oh, and I'm sorry. On 166, don't uh, I think I'm still on 166. Let me double check. Uh, you have the last item on the on the ordinance relative to trees, tree planting. Oh, sorry. Yes, I was looking at. Um, thank you. Um, right. So under the shading. Um, sorry. Under the um, screening section. Mm -hmm where there's a trigger for uh, tree, uh, tree planting um, t for trees over three inch in caliper that are removed, that um, a, a modification that says um, a variety of shade trees from the city's tree list and planting guidelines must be selected. Um, there's a request from the um, tree warden that that be referenced because that's, um, the tree list and planting guidelines have been adopted sort of citywide. So this is just a uniformity issue. The planning board has a tree planting list that's consistent with the um, plant list, the tree list in this guideline, but um, this would just um, clarify that um, and, and clean that piece up. So yes, that's the last one of that. Um, Okay, so then in Ordinance 5, uh, 20.167 was the Water Supply Protection um, District. And again, same thing in the under the uses allowed by right, um, eliminate a, a reference to accessory dwelling units and um, then clarify that single dwellings and two families require site plan review in the Water Supply Protection District. Then moving to number six, which is 20.168 in the SR and RR table of uses. Again, the modification to um, move the distinction of the 3,400 square foot as the threshold for the trigger site plan, just eliminate that and make any two family or two single families per lot um, trigger site plan. And again, um, remove all references to accessory dwelling units, either by right or by special permit um, that exist in those two tables. Number seven um, was 20.169. My recommendation would be to delete, just um, not vote on this one, take it out because this is the section that's just specifically in the site plan um, chapter of the zoning ordinance. Um, so since this is not, we're, 
I think the idea is not to create a separate distinction for two families at a 3,400 3, square foot threshold. There's no longer any need for this ordinance. Number eight, um, there Sorry, was no- Carolyn? Yeah? Just as a matter of process then, does um, the next one ordinance, eight of 10, become 20-169? Or do you no. keep, no. no. You no. keep that reference in there and just say it's not. Right, because it'll go through the process and then the recommendation would be not to adopt that particular ordinance if the committees decide to go that route. Um, so there won't be any renumbering um, of the ordinances. That gets to be too confusing, <laughs> I think. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so then the next one, um, 21... Dot 170, which is number eight, um, is that's not uh, relevant to this section. It's just um, leftover cleanup of the zoning, so no changes there. Number nine, uh, 20.171, um, the parking standards uh, provision. There were some tweaks of the language in there to clarify. We've gotten some questions about wet area. Um, you know, how to define and create design around parking for all residential uses, particularly in the urban residential A, B, and C district. So um, the first modification is really to try to make the language a little bit clearer about what the, um, where parking should be allowed um, in those districts. And the idea is not to, is to direct parking to the side um, and or rear of a structure um, and not between the structure and the street. And also to limit the width, the total width of pavement that's between the structure and the street. Um, so um, given that those districts are ones in which uh, that were built out in the city, um, going back before the advent of cars. And so it's not as prevalent to see what, you know, parking in front of a structure, in front of a house or to have houses set way back where you've got, you know, big expanses of, of driveway in front. Um, so that's the change there, including adding a graphic to better um, um, show that concept. And then 10, um, no changes to 10. So, that's the um, list of um, the modifications. Carolyn, excuse me. Can I can I ask for you to explain one thing that I <clears throat> didn't quite get? Are there any restrictions on square footage of second dwellings in the proposed amendment? No, so like no cap. So under an accessory dwelling, we currently say that anywhere in the city, you can have an accessory dwelling, but um, in the RRSR, Water Supply Protection Districts, um, NURA, that second unit can only be 900 square feet. This package would lift that cap and say, the unit is no longer capped at a certain size. Okay, in any district. Right. And of course, in URB and URC, two family is already allowed in addition to accessory dwellings, just because we allow accessory dwellings everywhere. So effectively, it doesn't really change anything in the URB and URC districts. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Carolyn, can you just clarify that there's existing restrictions on open space that, that still do limit the practical size, though? Just to clarify that. All so none of the open space requirements, as I said, you know, in the last hearing, none of the open space um, requiring requirements are being changed. None of the setbacks, front, side, rear setbacks are being changed. No heights, no other dimensional um, requirements are proposed to be changed. So you still need to meet the minimum 40, 50, 60 percent open space on a parcel. So you're restricted to the size based on that. 
Uh, Carolyn, you uh, also wrote a response to the UTC uh, expression of concern. I mean, one, one of the points that's important to make is that because the clock, once again, is ticking, you know, 90 days from the, the hearing, uh, it complicates things. At least their request to have it sent and referred to their committee for full review does complicate matters. So what was your, if you could share your response with everyone. Sure. So um, the um, obviously the um, any ordinance, any zoning amendment um, go is gets assigned to committees. Certainly, don't go out to every single committee in the city for review um, before city council takes action. Um, I did have a, a meeting with a subcommittee of the urban forestry um, committee. Um, to go over the zoning and describe the fact that, in fact, this is um, these um, this ordinance for the most part where two families are not currently allowed will trigger site plan review. Um, and under site plan review, there's all these other site um, development standards that come into play that have to be shown to the planning board, including the provisions for reviewing um, and submitting um, inventory of trees on a property that are over 20 inches, which are subject to the tree replacement criteria in the zoning. Um, and um, that's what the Urban Forestry Commission was targeting is that um, they wanted to make sure that this um, tree replacement criteria is, is you know, tagged or pulled in with this. It of course is if you're in a site plan review situation anyway. So that's already built into what's in front of you right now. Um, on top of that, there's additional tree, um, essentially tree replacement in a different formula that's going to be required for any two family that's above and beyond and doesn't apply to any other development in the city, not commercial development or any other residential development that if for the addition of a second unit on a property, you have to cut a tree that's bigger than three inches, which is much smaller than what's um, covered under the tree replacement formula in section 12 of the zoning ordinance, um, that there's a one for one tree planting requirement on the property. So, you know, um, and, and that doesn't apply to any other um, kind of residential development or commercial development in the city. So that's a new thing that's being added. Um, and that was to address concerns about um, development, um, the concern about cutting trees for, a, for um, a second unit being added to a property. And of course, anyone who wants to do just a minor addition to their single family house, just goes and gets a building permit and can cut as many trees as they want on their property for no reason at all. So, but at any rate, so my, my response really is that we did, we have addressed the issues in the, in the memo in terms of, um, and, and there may not have been understanding, but that um, for the most part, these, um, ordinances will be triggering site plan review, which um, of course addresses a lot more than just trees. Um, and um, and then of course the timeline um, for for reviewing the ninety day clock. Carolyn, can I ask a clarification about the tree um, replacement? Uh -huh. Or was or did I interrupt someone? I can't, I'm having trouble seeing uh, raise hand. Um, so so when 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 a tree is replaced, is there a stipulation that has to be the same kind of tree or that have the same amount of carbon sequestration? Excuse me, sequestration. <clears throat> um, it doesn't. There's no rep, it, the way the order. So I just went through the modifications <laughs> in. Um, I guess it was one six uh, ordinance four of ten which has the stipulation that um, it's 20.166 for the screening, um, has the stipulation that you have to plant a tree that's within the list of trees that have been pre-approved pre by the city um, as appropriate trees for planting in our climate. Um, so 
then you have the option of picking any of those trees. We don't anywhere in any ordinance in the city have a requirement for someone to try to calculate carbon sequestration coming or going based on trees. So no, that's not part of this. And I certainly would not recommend that it be part of this. Um, that's a tremendous burden to put on someone who wants to add one unit to their property right. when nobody else has to do it. And um, I got, thank you, Carolyn. And the other question was, um, does the intent to use solar play into trees? I mean, I assume you can replace them somewhere on your, anywhere else, anywhere on your, on the property. So if you're, yeah, talking, if you're cutting down trees for right. solar, how, is that impacted by that? So there are lots of trees in the tree. Um, well, so first of all, if you're creating, now this is only going to be triggered, right, if you're adding a second unit. So if during your process of adding a second unit, you're taking three trees down that are three inches in caliper to site this second unit, you can plant three trees of that list and they include smaller trees as well as taller trees. So there are sort of solar friendly kinds of um, trees that can be selected. Um, I will also add that as part of site plan review, once you're in site plan review, one of the requirements is for you to show that your roof is um, going to be constructed with a capacity to um, have um, to hold solar panels or oriented to be able to um, have solar and that the, the roof can carry the load. So that is actually a requirement of site plan review. You don't have to install solar, but you have to show that it's ready um, either on the roof or on the site somewhere. Okay, yeah, I didn't know um, that, thank you. I, I should say that actually there, there are instances where we actually do take carbon sequestration values into consideration. And that was that came up when we um, were drafting the ordinance relative to large scale solar development, particularly in wooded areas. And uh, we came up with a, a compensatory formula, but that's 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 different than this. This there's right that, that so I, right so for residential development anywhere we don't have that um, right. calculation. Right. Um, and, uh, also, can I ask the members of the public who are members of the public to turn off their cameras so that we can actually see who's participating in the meeting and we, that we, um, I also we can't find my raise hand feature, so I might have to go like this. I don't know why it was. That, that, that'll work. That'll work. I can see you. If okay. But it's strange. I was on a meeting earlier today that was there. Maybe it's just this. Okay. Anyway. Yes. I will just raise my hand manually. I'm sure they just decided to change the software because strange. Again, Alan. <laughs> yeah, um, I I have a major reservation about the proposed ordinance. Um, I think that any ordinance that is adopted by the planning board or even the city council needs to be looked at from the lens of afford the impact on affordability of housing. It doesn't have to be the only way in which it's evaluated, but it certainly has to be a major way. And I'm afraid that this ordinance will have a negative impact on affordability. Um, and that's by virtue of eliminating any restriction on the size of a second dwelling unit. Um, as a matter of fact, I think that there, well, yeah, I, let me explain why. I, I, clearly, um, the the um, the cost of housing is to some extent affected by the supply, supply and demand. But I think more than that, since there seems to be an almost insatiable demand in Northampton for large and expensive houses, um, it's impacted by the size of the dwelling. Um, and I, I think that what's going to happen is that people will build um, when they have the legal right, um, 
2,500, 3,000, 3,500 square feet houses that will sell for a half a million dollars. Um, and because you can't build a house of that size and sell it for less than that. I think we have an opportunity to restrict the size of the dwelling, which will necessarily push down the price. I think if we say that there can be no larger than a thousand square feet, maybe 1100, I don't know, something in that range, there could be a small two family house that would be built and sold at a more affordable rate. Um, and I just don't understand the benefit to the public of eliminating the cap altogether. Seems to me that that is opposed to the objective of uh, affordable housing. As a matter of fact, I would go the opposite direction. I think we ought to look at extend having a cap of a thousand feet or whatever it is and extend it down to B and C. There's no reason why someone in, um, in, in zone, those zoning districts should be able to build a house of, you know, that'll sell for a half a million dollars and have four or five bedrooms and th two or three cars and um, uh, have all sorts of negative impacts on the community. So I think it's going in the exact wrong direction. And I, I, I think it's inevitable that there will be negative consequences. Chris. Can I, oh. Oh, well, uh, let Chris can I, speak first and then Carolyn. Yeah, I, I, I'm just wondering if, Carolyn, if you can explain, because so we say we're a two family by right community. Um, and then with a lot of these ordinances, we've changed it. So two family isn't by right, it's by special permit. Um, I can, is, so I'm wondering, can you just explain to us which, which zones have the two family by right? Are those the ones that are capped at the 800 square feet or something by right? And then when you get higher than that, that's when you trigger a special permit. And then there's other zones where it's special permit for any two family. Yeah, so I think if we had an overall overarching look at every zone, maybe we could all understand a little bit better. Like after this is adopted, what is the, the overall impact in all the all the different zones? So right now we're only we only allow two family units by right in two zoning districts, and those are sort of core districts around downtown and, and Florence and Florence Center. Um, we do allow second units as part of a single family home um, that are called accessory dwelling units. And they have additional restrictions of a 900 square foot cap, an owner occupancy requirement um, for one of the units. So an owner has to live in either the accessory unit or the principal unit. Um, the proposed zoning and um, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear, triggers site plan approval. That's a different permitting process from special permit. And technically under land use law, site plan still means the use is allowed by right. But you need to go to the planning board for a site plan review that looks at technical requirements that need to be met. So the heating systems, the rooftop solar capacity, the landscaping, the um, you know lighting, those kinds of issues are addressed in site plan. The use is still allowed. The planning board can't say, no, you can't have that use, um, but you need to make sure you address you know, these 25 things. Um, special permit is really a, a process where the planning board can say, well, you know, in this location, that use is not allowed. So this ordinance would not um, create a special permit process for any second unit that would be added. Um, I do, I also want to go back to the public hearing a few weeks ago and emphasize that this ordinance by itself isn't intended to be an affordable housing, meaning subsidized affordable housing. Um, 
ordinance, but it's a package of four ordinance amendments that are coming forward to address a whole range of housing and to create, to sort of open up housing to address what Alan was saying about supply and demand issues. So we don't have potentially, we don't have enough incentives to address housing that is attainable for people who are at different income levels. Um, so yes, people can build two a duplex that is 3,500 square feet, you know, total or a duplex that's 7,000 square feet, you know, divided by two, those two units may not be affordable, you know, attainable for everyone, but they're, they're more attainable individually as a condo duplex than buying a 7,000 square foot detached single family house out on Sylvester Road. And we also wanna provide opportunity for people to be able to say they want to live on Sylvester Road, but maybe not live in such a big house. Maybe they want to be part of a second, you know, a two family construct. Um, and they also maybe want to be able to live in other places in the city where right now they can't. 900 square feet is too small for a family of three or four. So the idea isn't, the idea is to sort of lift that constraint and allow more opportunity for people to have choice of where they could potentially buy into something or rent something in different parts of the city where they can't rent now or buy now. Um, but again, as part of this sort of four pronged approach of zoning packages that are coming forward, we've got, we're just trying to set an agenda for two more of them. One of them would be actually focused on an incentive to create smaller units. Um, and that was just introduced to council last week. And it's, it would um, essentially create an incentive to build 800 square foot or smaller units. Um, and that's another way to sort of target a part of the market that um, we know there's a demand for those smaller units but it doesn't then just only allow that kind of unit. We wanna also allow um, you know, larger units if people feel like they want those larger units and we want to allow you know, um, easier access for subsidized affordable housing units. So, um, and along with the zoning packages that will come forward with downtown Florence and downtown Northampton where we're encouraging housing on the first floor, which has not been allowed um, before. George. Oh, you're still muted. You're still muted. I'm sorry. There you go. Alan, thanks for your comments, Alan. Um, and, and I can appreciate where you're coming from at that upper end of those um, McMansions that may be built. And, and I think that's what we've heard from the residents of the Bay State neighborhood recently, that everything seems to be those over the top houses. Um, but I think also that that's not outliers, but they're one end of the pattern that we'll see. The other end, which we've seen recently in a development down in Ward 3 and also up in Florence is that families resident in a single family home built small homes behind their houses, one to, to house their mother and father who were moving up from the South and another one to house their son who had special needs. So, and those, both of those houses I think are coming in under 900 square feet. Um, so, and that was done before this ordinance for sure. But I think the hope is that a lot of the, those situations uh, may lend themselves now um, within the parameters of this ordinance. We will see smaller homes by residents who live there and they won't all be out of town developers coming in and doing teardowns. Um, well, good, let's encourage more of them by having a cap. Um, if, if one of the things that we always get hung up on on this is, and, and in fact, everyone in the community gets hung up on the term affordable um, because it's an amorphous, term uh, depends. You get resistance to people who think that affordable housing is being developed near them and they think it's, they think it's subsidized housing. They react with a certain bias that's always disturbing to see, but the fact is um, 
they're just projecting what affordable means to them. There actually is a HUD standard for affordability. Um, uh, the houses that Alan described as being on the higher end of this does not qualify as such, but in the fact is our definition of what's affordable would change for every single person who's sitting here would be different for each one of us. So it's, a, it's, it's not a useful term for the most part. I think the, uh, if we go by the HUD standard, it's, uh, Carolyn, you will correct me, I think it's 80% of the area mean, um, which for some reason we're folded in with Springfield, I think, which is, gives us some kind of weird skewed number, but I, I the, so as Carolyn said, this is part of a package and maybe, you know, if um, maybe probably <laughs> if, if this were more strategic, this wouldn't be the leading package that we would be facing now to be discussing this issue. Um, if we discuss, you know, if, for instance, the conversation were prefaced by the one that we're, that we're going to have about the much smaller units, the, the tiny house uh, structures that we're going to be discussing, it would be a different form of debate. ADUs, of course, are different than second homes, uh, second, ho uh, uh, second family houses. Um, so, you know, w at least I'm, I'll speak for me, being on the council, I just want to be clear on the terms and understand what, what the definitions that we're employing so that we're all basically rowing in the same direction. Also, Dwight. Yeah, Chris, yeah. I have a question for Carolyn. On these accessory dwellings or second units by right on a piece of property, Alan had suggested something that I actually didn't think about. Can these people build these properties and then put them on the market to sell? And if so, how does that happen if it's all on one lot? Well, it's um, yes. The answer is yes. The idea is that it could be, you could create a two, a, um, a condex you know, a two unit um, condominium. I mean, we have them now. Um, the, the difference, um, the reason, so the idea about creating and just having sort of one term for the second unit instead of having a two family versus a single family with accessory unit is to essentially create more flexibility for people if they want a unit that's more than 900 square feet and also eliminate the ownership requirement, frankly, that, that an owner be, you know, own one of the units and, and either rent out or create a condex of the, um, of the other unit. Um, the, I, but the, um, and we want to get out of sort of the monitoring of who owns what and who's moved out and playing drawing straws for um, whether or not there's a tenant in there. I mean, the idea isn't uh, the idea is to allow that kind of flexibility. Some, you know, if someone needs to rent their home for a time, um, uh, then they can do that, and it, and it's not going to they're not going to be penalized for that. Um, but more importantly, it's to allow flexibility for creating housing types that are, and, and again, as Bill said, this isn't targeted to create defined, as we define it in our zoning and based on HUD's definition of affordable housing. However, and that's why we're using this sort of attainable housing concept is that it's allowing a different mix of housing and potentially the ability for someone to say, you know, it's uh, cost me a lot less to share a roof with someone else if I just, if there are two units here, instead of having, you know, being forced into looking and finding a single family detached house, you know, that is um, more expensive and not as, um, and it's not as efficient living as, as a two family. Um, Councilor Nash and Councilor Murphy, can I ask, uh, this is, at this point, Councilor Nash, I see you have your hand up, but this is actually a conversation between the deliberators. The hearing has been closed, so we're uh, uh, not accepting input at this point. Councilor Nash, I would point out that you have an opportunity to deliberate and debate should this survive and go to the council floor. So there you'll have a, you'll have an equal voice. But 
if I could invite you both to turn off your cameras so that we can see all the participants uh, in in the, both the planning board and the and the legislative matters, I'd appreciate that. Thank you, uh, George. Um, so I don't want to move beyond this little thread. Um, if other folks want to speak to it about the uh, the attainability, the affordability, the range of houses, we'll see. But I want to make sure that um, I get a little clarity on the item that was brought up by the public around um, the, the uh, demolition delay process. Um, and I don't know how this fits into this package of amendments unless I missed something earlier on. So Carolyn, could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think that's coming up on the legisl uh, legislative matters agenda later, um, and Sarah's going to speak to that. It doesn't relate to the um, this ordinance at all. Um, we don't require a notification for building permit issuance um, to the public either, and that sort of first cut demo permit is just like any other building permit that's submitted, but I know Sarah will talk about that. Um, and the the complexities or the two tiered process for demolition review. Oh, I see. We didn't see the full agenda for legislative matters. So right. I didn't right. know what the abutters, what the folks were talking about. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when we finish our deliberations and make a recommendation, they're going to stay incessant. Right. Vice versa from what we normally do. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. <clears throat> yeah. All right. You, you don't have to suffer us more than than it is required, I promise. Uh, actually, to that point, any of the members of Legislative Matters have some questions? Um. I heard an um, but what was Yes, yeah, so I have so many questions. Okay. I was trying to, I'm trying to kind of ask questions on the topic at hand. Hmm. I will say would it would be easier to to consider this if we had the whole picture of the other ordinances in the pipeline because I, I tend to agree with Alan I don't having no cap um, I, 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 I we can argue about what affordable housing is but I think that or even attainable housing but I, I think you know it's I think we know that those kind of larger you know those larger units are not going to be affordable uh, by a lot of people's standards. And, um, I, you know, I think we have, a, we have an opportunity to, to kind of navigate that. I don't know, you know, if you're saying there's going to be mixed units or that's the hope, kind of different tiers of attainability, but what's to guarantee that? It seems um, maybe George could speak to like the percentage of, of, you know, of, of units that are being made that are, are, for, are smaller or for family members, those examples that George gave, uh, because it seems like it's going kind of the opposite way, especially now with remote uh, work being the standard and having people, urban refugees from more expensive areas coming in. I, I don't know how we could kind of guarantee there it won't all just be rather unatt unattainable housing without any kind of cap. Well, I guess I want to sort of go back to that because I think I and I don't think you need to wait for the other ordinances to catch up. I really wanted to provide that as context is that um, they really need to stand alone um, on the on their own. And what we're trying to do is create a number of different options for people and whether or not they're affordable to you or to a school teacher or to um, you know, anyone else is not necessarily the, I, I think the focus of this is to say, we have restrictions. It's an, it's also, it's very much an equity issue. We have restrictions in a large part of the city that says, you know what, this is only for single family homes. We don't want anything else there. And that, um, has a long history in segregation and racism and, um, 
I think that it's time that the city address that and say, look, why are we creating these enclaves where only people on large lots in large single family detached homes can live? And, um, you know, I and so that's a large part of this. Let's start breaking apart this history that zoning has played in segregating communities and telling people that there are certain people that aren't allowed to come in and whether they're from a different community and they shouldn't be moving into our neighborhoods or if they're within our community and they shouldn't be moving into, you know, a different neighborhood. And so I think um, that's a big part of this. Um, and so the number, and so then that speaks to why should we tell people, well, you can move into this neighborhood and get a smaller a, a unit, but you have to be relegated to this small unit that's only 900 square feet. Um, well, you can't have, mm -hmm. excuse me, Paul, I'm Carolyn. Yes, yeah, so you can't have the same size unit that someone might have in another district in the city. Um, so I, I think that we really need to move away from dictating where someone might want to have, you know, be able to live in another unit and in another location in the city um, and uh, just allow for that. It might not happen to some person in, to, in some person's mind. It might be, oh, this is all going to result in large, you know, really, um, high-end housing. Um, we don't know that for sure, um, but um, I think then sort of looking at the other part of the pieces of the package is we also at the same time are going to create incentive for smaller units so that we do have um, potentially more options for people who don't want to live in a large house. Um, so Right, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm absolutely supportive of those goals. I think it's not about keeping it single family or 900 square feet even, but I, it sounds like we have some latitude within that. Um, but I'm, I am absolutely supportive of the, of the goal of giving flexibility and increasing housing stock in general. But I do wonder about having no cap um, in terms of where steering. And I'm not saying the cap would have to be 900 square feet, but. Uh, David Whitehill and then Council Shera. Thanks. Um, so I just have a couple points just for people to think about, I guess. Um, number one, I just wanted to point out, I mean, there's a lot of really complicated dynamics that affect housing affordability or lack thereof. The biggest one, the biggest dynamic that we all experience in, within a region, though, is, I mean, any realtor can tell you it's location. Um, I mean, the fact is, um, you know, when neighbors like from Bay State Village come, what they're telling us is we have a really nice neighborhood. A really nice neighborhood inherently creates high home values because it's a nice place to live. If you wanna decrease your home values, go around mugging your neighbors. I mean, that'll create a horrible situation that nobody wants to live in and the housing price will go down. Nobody wants that solution. So it's sort of a, um, uh, it's a perfect storm or, uh, you know, you create a good neighborhood and the housing prices go up. But so that's the facts of life, unfortunately. Um, and one thing I want to think, just sort of warn everybody about thinking of is comparing the choices that we have to something realistic. The fact is we don't get to like say, do we want to do this or do we want to do the perfect thing that I had in my imagination? Because that's not what our choice is. I mean, the fact is there is a benefit to everybody in the city when even when wealthy people buy houses in our city from outside of Northampton because they're contributing to the tax base, to the property, they keep us, that's one more year that we don't have to raise property taxes possibly, you know, maybe we do, I don't know. You know, it's, it, it adds to the general wealth in Northampton that helps everybody uh, in, in our sort of little commonwealth. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is this sort of, what I think is a totally false comparison of there's like the big existing mother house and then the baby house and we should cap that. Under the current rule, say you can say, you know, with your setbacks and your open space requirements, you could build 6,000 square feet of house. So currently you could knock down the house and build a 6,000 square foot single family home. <laughs> what this is trying to make it do is a little bit easier 
to build two 3,000 square foot homes. So there's nothing more affordable about the 6,000 square foot house that is allowed today, right? So in fact, it doesn't increase the housing supply. It just gives those people more living rooms and whatever. Um, the other thing I wanna point out is, as there was some confusion earlier about are, are we by right and we're sort of technically by right, but it's site plan review, that we are inherently raising the housing cost by making a more complicated process. Every developer will pad the cost of the housing that they sell. Whether you're a developer because you're evil and you're from the next town over, or you're a developer and you're really good because you're from Northampton, it doesn't matter. The more meetings you go to, the more times you have to resubmit, the longer you have to hold that loan from the bank, you're gonna pad the cost by 10, 15, 20%. That increases housing cost. So I think we should just not make this illusion that developers are just like Scrooge McDuck or something sitting on piles of money and like, they're all evil. <laughs> like you're a developer, if you built your own house, you're developing your house, you know, this, this is all like semantics. Um, the point is increasing the supply, the easier we make it within the parameters of what we have in Northampton, which is like a really successful set of great neighborhoods, <laughs> you know, uh, that's what we can do to help housing apart from the very necessary stuff on affordability and subsidies and all those other things, which is very complicated and uh, is, is not a separate issue, but is a related issue. Councilor Shara. Um, Carolyn, you touched on this before, but could you talk a little bit more about how the open space requirements in the different districts will affect how, you know, what size can be allowed? Sure. Um, so <clears throat> dif different districts have different minimum uh, required areas that need to be left sort of open to the sky, no buildings, no driveways, um, and um, no, you know, parking pads. None of that, the, all of that counts as impervious surface and it um, is subtracted from the required minimum open space. Um, so for example, in the urban residential A, I believe the minimum open space requirement is 50%. So today, if I wanted to build a large single family house, I could build it as large as I want, so long as I don't, you know, I come, can come right up to the edge of that 50% open space, as long as I meet all the setbacks from the front side and rear, I can build a single family house as large as I want. Nobody, you know, has to review it. I just get my building permit. The same would hold true if on that same footprint as David was suggesting, you know, the 6,000 square foot house, if instead you build two units that are 3,000 square feet each, you still need to meet that same open space, the same setbacks. It's just that you have two kitchens and two separate bathing areas for two families in that structure. Um, and, you know, different, like further out in the SR and RR districts, the open space is a little bit um, more uh, required um, out in those areas. But um, none of that would change. And there was a question about, you know, what if you build a house behind a house, you still have those setbacks, you still have the minimum open space and they, so every roof adds up to that um, pervious number and you ha that has to be balanced out with the minimum open space. Um, so does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Um, if I may, also, it should, we should understand, actually, this is to David's point, that Northampton's had a population of 29,000 for over 100 years. When Calvin Coolidge was mayor of the city, it had 29,000. Now, we built lots of structures since then. So how the hell does that work? Well, what happened was there were large houses with... Uh, large families. Families were larger. They're all contained within. Then at a period moving towards the uh, 40s and 50s, these houses got divided into multifamily houses. You got multiple meters on these large houses that used to house one wealthy family. We And to that extent, we have these neighborhoods have evolved organically. They did not, they, they weren't a product of planning, although they are maintained under planning for the most part. And what we're talking about is trying to create available housing stock. And this goes back to supply and demand and the competitive nature of supply and demand. 
And right now, there is a very there is a very big demand, as everyone's noted. And I don't know how long that lasts. You know, till the next pandemic, or whatever, and whatever inspires people to move suddenly from urban areas or suburban areas to more quasi rural areas such as us and makes us appealing. We, the, this, what's being proposed, at least in my mind, is actually makes sense insofar as we don't get to dictate every rule and every item. There has to be some flexibility built in. Um, we can't create our individual fantasies, as David pointed out. That, that's, um, that's where most conflicts evolve from because we have competing fantasies. fantasies. But I think that, um, because I do think of this in context of the packages that are coming, I also think of it in context of the discussion of the resiliency plan, which also emphasized the fact that, the very critical fact that in all our deliberations and all our considerations that impact on carbon production and our contribution to uh, climate change has to be foremost in our thoughts and discussions. Um, that hasn't really come up much. I mean, Carolyn's referred to it a few times, but the fact is, is that the, these systems promote that type of new conservation conscientious structures that don't create uh, a demand on fossil fuel and fossil fuel consumption. When you create density, you also reduce um, trip uh, usage, uh, the need for multiple cars. You, but the pressures as you increase the population are on schools. They're on, as David pointed out, on the infrastructure, on the existing infrastructure. But the fact is that when we start building out and intensifying and outlying areas, we thereby have to accommodate it with functioning hot, you know, current uh, uh, infrastructure like storm drains, sewers, uh, uh, water supplies, fire, uh, fire response, police response, all of that. So it is, it's a delicate balancing act. And I think for the people who spoke in favor of this in public comment, um, it's worth acknowledging that their interest is the opportunity to live in a community that we brag on at the same time we are resistant to anyone joining us in some respects. And the, our job is to try and figure out how you thread the needle to create the greater good for the gr largest amount of people, knowing full well there'll be consequences and that will not be appealing to to well hell anybody i mean I, i'm talking to the planning board for god's sakes i mean i don't know how many times you guys have held a meeting where you've heard somebody say good for you we agree thank you so much thank you for your time i don't i bet you don't get a lot of that so so um i think we have to keep in mind what zoning's supposed to do and what it can't do. And one thing is that it, we can corral, shape, and maneuver affordability. We cannot guarantee it. We cannot embed it in the system. We can only create incentives for affordability. And by increasing housing stock, I think you do because it provides more opportunity if the supply is the, I mean, I agree that the appealing neighborhoods are part and parcel of the appeal, but at the same time, the limited availability of properties also creates greater pressures and pushes housing values up, which if you own a house, that's great until, until your house is assessed for taxes. But, um, you know, that's, these are, the, these are the gives and takes. Um, Alan, I'm sorry. Yes, you would be happy to hand back. Yeah, I'd like to basically reiterate the same argument that I've made, but I want to respond, um, Bill, when you talk about threading the needle, I think this is an opportunity to do it. We can produce more housing, which is a good thing, and by limiting the size of some of it, um, we can hopefully impact 
the uh, cost of it. it, it because if, if, a, if a builder, whether they're a developer or an homeowner on the, already on the lot, can build something for less cost, they can sell it for less. That's you know, just plain old common sense. If we give someone an opportunity to build the half million dollar house that is selling so rapidly in Northampton, that's probably what will get built. And I think we will be derelict in our responsibilities to the city of Northampton to not use a tool that we have available to push the cost down for some housing that otherwise will not get built. Uh, George, you referred to a couple of uh, uh, permits that we approved for relatives or whatever, that's true. And that will continue to hap happen because it was for a specific use. But if someone has, um, <clears throat> has, is going to build something that they're gonna put on the market and, and have to make it a thousand feet, 1100 feet, which could be a small two bedroom house, um, then they'll do that. And if we don't force them to do it, they won't. Um, I think, um, uh, David, you referred to location being so primary in determining the cost. And that's of course true. Location is, you know, uh, the old saw location, location, location. But the size and type of the house, it's also extremely important. If we require them to build a smaller house, it will get um, sold for or rented for less money. I see no reason whatsoever that we should not take this opportunity to accomplish that. Alan, I have a question. I mean, essentially, the rules that we adopted that now allow ADUs, um, the, the modified zoning that we created to uh, promote the use of and development of infill and the ADUs. Bill, what's um, an ADU? Uh, auxiliary dwelling, I'm sorry, or mother-in-law apartment or whatever the, gotcha. yeah. Um, um, the, the, I, I believe the, the intent and the drivers for uh, that zoning changes were for the very reasons that Alan's bringing up, right? To create, to generate an affordable housing stock to give people an opportunity, for instance, who are aging out of their house or feel that they want to move into a smaller unit, maybe even rent out their main unit to allow uh, to subsidize their existence in their backyard in a smaller home, or as in the case of George pointed out in Florence, which I have to, in the interest of full disclosure, re reveal that that's my sister. Um, <laughs> but, so, but just so we're clear. Um, and but isn't that what we? Is, wasn't that the intent of the of the ADU, uh, ADU uh, zoning changes? Well, let's keep doing. So uh, so we did <clears throat> approve, we did uh, 30 years ago now, um, the zoning ordinance was amended um, to allow that, uh, was, I, I understand, I wasn't here then, but I understand that it was a bit controversial. Um, and yes, that was sort of a baby step forward to allow additional units. Um, but it doesn't fit everybody. People need different sizes, size homes. And you know, I'm not an expert in real estate, David, and there are other people um, probably on this Zoom that understand the markets better than I, but you know, if you build an 1100 square foot unit and you add 500 more square feet under that same roof, it's not gonna be that much more um, cost um, unless you're adding, you know, big, like a pool or another, um, you know, kitchen or bedroom. Um, so I'm not sure that just saying, you know, the price per square foot, I guess, is the other way to look at it, is a lot higher in a 900 square foot unit than it is if you built the same thing, but just add on another bedroom that makes it 1,200 or 1,300 square feet. So I don't know that that's, um, you know, I, I think that we have had that it's not meeting our needs and it also is still creating this sort of um, burden or gap um, in allowing people choice um, to live in different neighborhoods and have the opportunity to live the way other people live if they wanted to do that. And we can't dictate, you know, whether how much it's gonna cost and almost every unit now coming on 
is expensive because the construction costs, and I know Krista can speak to that, but the building materials have skyrocketed. Um, it's not that people are building high-end homes per se, it's that the building materials and the construction costs are so high that they're coming in at, you know, a level that's, um, you know, higher than what most of us can fathom. Um, and, and by continuing to add requirements like, you know, multiple layers of, you know, solar panels on the roof or tree replacement or different lighting or different, you know, size, whatever that's going to continue to add to them we have the stretch code that makes it really expensive too these new houses are very energy efficient and they're much tighter than any of the existing housing stock and we saw in the presentation that you know that's where we're losing our greatest um that's where we have a lot our most energy waste and our biggest carbon footprint is old building stock so these new buildings are expensive to build because they're that much more energy efficient and the building materials and construction costs are so high. George? Um, so back to the range of houses that could be available or are available in the city. Um, I think there's always gonna be a demand. You know, there, there are folks who wanna build a very McMansion kind of house. We're, we see up at the Pine Grove conservation area that just changed over. There's five building lots there they'll be built on lickety split because they're available and that's where people want to live. What we want to do, I think, is try to provide other options. And this is where this infill got a bad kind of taste to it, but we want to provide those options closer to the center of town for those people who demand kind of a, a house with four bedrooms. Um, they're not always going to be unsightly. Um, but I would rather have them living downtown in these closer to the urban areas than out in Leeds and the outreaches of Florence um, so we can kind of manage that growth better. And I think that's where we can't kind of stop that demand for those, that type of houses. Um, unfortunately, you know, we years ago when we looked at Village Hill, we had hoped that there was going to be a... Uh, a whole range of what was then termed workforce housing for our teachers and police. And, and at that time we were banding about costs of, or a price of like 200,000, 250,000. Unfortunately, that just didn't happen other than in kind of very um, tight areas. We, we, our, our community just isn't able to provide that kind of housing in the amount that might be needed um, for that woman who spoke earlier, Kristen, who has to leave Northampton, um, you know, until we can provide incentives to a builder who can build things of that nature um, and only sell them for two hundred and fifty, three hundred thousand dollars, um, I think we need to provide a, an opportunity for builders to do whatever they they can at this point. So, my take. I just had a, a follow up question for George. This is a citywide ordinance. You're saying that we're, we want to encourage that in the downtown areas, but this ordinance would impact um, and the lack of a cap would impact all of uh, the city, correct? Yes, it oh, would okay. impact all of Florence, it would impact all of Leeds. Yes, it would be. But I think by allowing the infill to happen in more of the downtown areas that they're going to be more attractive. And by downtown, now I mean the Bay State area, the upper reaches of South Street. Um, I think there's a real pension for people who live closer to the urban center. But they don't want to, they want to still live in a good sized house for their, whatever their needs might be. Um. So uh, as, as the process here, I don't know what's the uh, uh, legislative matters, what's the process? Would you prefer that we go item by item and, and vote? Or do you want to, uh, you want to discuss the amendments that Carolyn's proposed? Because we'd have to include those actually, we'd have to vote those in as part of the recommendation. What's your pleasure? 
Does it That's make sure. any sense to take a straw poll just on the issue that we've been discussing about unlimited size or some limit? We could take a straw poll. I mean, um, yeah, yeah. I, I have no no objection to that. Um, uh, Alan, why don't you, since it's your straw poll, why don't you frame it? Um, all those in favor of straw? Uh, no, uh, wrong poll. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, my my suggestion would be that we limit the size of of a second dwelling unit on a single lot to uh, 1,100 square feet. I might just add, which is an aside, that I would like to see an, a provision taken up to extend that to uh, B and C, but that's not before us tonight. So I just throw that in, but that would be my suggestion. So, so you- 1,200. Yeah, so uh, all those interested in pursuing the discussion of a 1,200 foot cap for the second units, please indicate by raising your hand. Wow. <laughs> I see three, right? Krista, you're, you're voting, not, not asking to speak. Okay. All right. So I see three. I would like to hear from uh, other members of the planning board if they're comfortable who haven't spoken up because I know this is, you know, your purview and I'd be interested to hear a little bit more if, if and if you don't want to, that's okay too. <laughs> well, I just, I think throwing out a number is arbitrary. Um, so I don't know that 1200 is the right number. Uh, I would also want to have a mechanism for going above and beyond that number if that were a special permit or or something else if there's a higher standard um, you know if we're gonna if we're gonna set some sort of a cap I think we need to be able to look at it instead of just throwing out a number that we're voting on Marissa. Um, and I would say for, for my part, I'm not, I'm not in favor of a cap um, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, I think in the, the closer in town areas where the lot sizes are smaller, that the, the, the zoning restraints, that the, the zoning will restrain the size of, of, of buildings to, to some degree, um, maybe not as much as people, uh, you know, the immediate abutters would always like, but I think it would, um, there, there's some constraint on, on smaller lots. Um, as you get closer to town. Um, the, I also agree, um, Chris, that I think A, 1100 is, is arbitrary. I don't know when was, and I, and I really don't mean to sound sort of snarky about this, but I, Alan, I don't know when was the last time you lived in an 1100 foot square foot home. Um, it's, it's a cap. Um, if that's the cap, it, it's, it's arbitrary in and of itself. It is a cap that is going to Necess it, it will necessarily um, omit this whole swath of housing as a possibility to many, many families because um, it just simply won't accommodate it, their needs. Um, so, uh, so those are, are the are the are, are my biggest um, reasons. I also just think, as a general matter, that we there is a housing shortage across all strata of levels of housing, and so yes, I mean. We live in a, in a desirable city, and housing values and building costs are up, and and this is and this makes it difficult. And it is something that I know we will want to continue to um, to um, to address. But it it is not it is not just the case that that we need um, housing for um, uh, for for working class folks or even poor folks, middle class, upper middle classy people even. Um, need need to have housing in this community that that fits their that fits their needs and uh, is is there for them. I would also just say, just like the lawyer and me, if by right somebody can tear down their existing 1,100 square foot house and build a 6,000 square foot house, single family house on the same spot without any planning board involvement at all, 
I mean, for me, there's just like, no, that makes this debate kind of moot. I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about what people can by right do and by right, they can, they can build, a, you know, much larger houses that are incredibly inefficient that don't meet our housing needs and are certainly not affordable and they don't have that and we can't say boo about it. So this is a way that we can um, influence, uh, you know, people's decisions um, and, and nudge them um, if, you know, toward, toward making different decisions about that, that will help the housing stock, that will have energy efficiencies um, and uh, all of those kinds of things. And, and I guess I would just close by saying I, there's, there isn't any magic number that I would, so 1100 is, strikes me as arbitrary. I would say, I don't, I don't know what the number is that I'd be okay with. I mean, like, I, I, I think we're better off just letting the zoning regulations do their work um, and that it'll, it'll, you know, it'll come out in the wash. It will come out in half million dollar houses. You know, I, Alan, I, I you you keep saying that, and I and I I hear what you're saying, but I can think of a number of developments, um, and a number of developments, and another number of uh, buy right, you know, uh, of just projects around my neighborhood that I've seen. So housing costs are what they are, and building costs are what they are. So it's it's more expensive right now to build than it has been in a long time. Yes, and. That's true, but it's just simply not the case that every house that's going on the market right now is like a 750k monstrosity. It's just not. <laughs> um, I mean, check the real estate listings. There, I mean, uh, you know, I I would like for my parents to be able to move here from Texas, and it's you know there aren't great options in their price range, and and you know so I'm mindful of that. But it's there's not n there's not nothing. <laughs> That's just a little bit above theirs, and and it, and they, and they certainly aren't in the the 500, 750k. You know, at the risk of putting my own personal information out there, is I've been looking at the real estate listings. People, developers are building, you know, what the, what they can within the limits of the market and what our zoning allows, and it's not it's not all McMansions. It's not. It's good. It's to their credit. Council Shara, you had your hand up. If if not, Council Thorpe would follow. I I did, but Councilor Thorpe and, and I see that Jana also has her hand up, so I, I can wait until other people have spoken. Thank you, Councilor, uh, uh, Councilor Dwight. I, I want to concur with uh, Marissa Elkins just said. I mean, there's, it, the zoning has been too it has been restrictive for, for so long that um, we need to increase our housing stock. And, and in regards to affordability, if you look down on Pomeroy Terrace, where your, your units are 800 in square feet, for 344,000, <clears> how many people can afford that? So the cap I'm not for, and the, the you know the 1,200 or 1,100 square footage that you, that was thrown out, I find it to be arbitrary as well. So thank you. Thank you, and Jenna, I'm sorry I didn't see your hand. Uh, I'm sorry too, and I apologize. I've been having all kinds of connectivity issues, so if I repeat something that somebody else has said, I've missed part of the discussion because of uh, internet issues today. Um, but I wanna also reiterate what Marissa said and, and say I'm, I'm strongly against any cap. I think, you know, we've heard recently that the housing stock, I mean, the population in Northampton is stagnant and the population, the um, housing stock has actually decreased. So we already know that um, zoning that allows small units to be built by right in the city doesn't get us where we need to go. And when I first read this package that Carolyn sent, my biggest kind of regret about it is that, as David said, site plan review is triggered and it means it's adding this extra layer of complication and cost um, and burden to people who wanna build additional housing. Maybe some developers, yes, some homeowners, homeowners whoever wants to do that, um, you know, I'm, I, I'm glad that it, in doing so we can support um, you know, the tree canopy and support moving off of fossil fuels. I think those are worthy endeavors, but already this is, making building housing for more people, for, for two families instead of one family, heavily more restrictive than it is for single families. And we're, I, I, I think what this is doing is allowing more people to share in what single families are already allowed to do by right. And I think the only way we could fairly limit 
what happened in a second unit would be to also limit the building of a single family house. And I don't even want to imagine the uproar that would come before us if we propose that, nor would I be in favor of it. I don't think that that's really what's gonna bring this city where it needs to go. I live on Hancock Street. Um, there is a house, two houses down from me that has eight bedrooms. There's a condex across the street. I live in a, a, a two, two unit apartment building. I mean, there's all kinds of housing going around, around here. And yes, I chose to live in downtown in a, in a dense area, but that kind of organic mix, um, I look at as an asset um, and I am, I would love to see this ordinance go through and I'm strongly against anything that makes it any more restrictive than it already is um, for this additional uh, building to be happening. Thank you, Jenna. Uh, Melissa, I see you're unmuted. Are you, you queued up to speak? Yeah. I thought I had my hand up, but yes, thank you. Um, I, again, I won't take up any more time. I'm very much um, in line with what um, Jana and Marissa stated. Um, I'm very much in favor of this and I'm very much opposed to a, a cap. Um, I think um, choices um, change is never going to please everyone. Um, Giving folks choices across the board, in my mind, is favorable. Um, and uh, you know this. This you all you all know this because you live in Northampton. This it's a great place. I mean, I was born here, and even when I lived out in California, I would run into people that knew of Northampton. And um, uh, yeah, I, I just I I think eliminating as much of the um, the red tape as we can to allow for uh, increasing the supply I, I'm in favor of. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, David, get your hand up. Thanks, I know I already spoke, so I'll, I'll try to be as brief as I can. I just wanted to also just point out just a, there's a lot of different issues being thrown around and, and um, just to point out that there's a difference between the bulk, the mass of housing and then the use that happens within a building. And really what we're talking about here, we're not really altering this, the bulk that's allowed on a lot because the setbacks aren't changing, the open space is not changing. We're really just trying to loosen up the use that can happen within the building envelope in, in some small way. And really to get back to sort of making it legal to build the kind of neighborhoods that Northampton is already full of, to be honest, you know? If someone came along and tried to build Bay State Village today, like under our current zoning uh, regime, like good luck. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out to Alan, you know, this thing about a minimum or I guess a maximum is putting an 1100 square foot cap. It doesn't force anyone to build 1100 square foot housing. It just makes it illegal to build bigger. So what you do is you just don't get much housing because it's not gonna be as cost effective to, to do that because you can only get, a, it maxes out what you can do. And it still costs this much to get the concrete guy to show up and build your foundation, you know, no matter how big your foundation is. Um, and the other thing is, I just want to point out that this bulk use dynamic is like how small this, it, it really goes back to something Carolyn said about the dominance of the single family mindset and just like how much our status quo, how strong the status quo bias is to like what we have is that like we have a technology for building 1100 square foot homes you stack them on top of each other and you put a doorbell on the front and you call it an apartment building. And nobody is even going anywhere near that because we just know like people will just burn down their own neighborhoods for some reason. Um, you know, I, th I think it goes to sort of like really thinking hard about what people are saying when they're saying, oh, that building is a detrimental use that's detrimental to the neighborhood. Like I just, it's very hard for me to understand why all of the buildings that are like built before 1930, none of those happen to be detrimental buildings, you know? Like what a coincidence, that they're only the new ones, yeah? I, I just think it's that's worth really thinking about what, what's actually being said there. George? So Bill, I just wondered partly as process, you know, if uh, the planning board members wanted to get any last questions out to Carolyn about these 
nine ordinance and uh, then <clears throat> kind of make our our recommendation and uh, leave the rest to the legislative matters for that big agenda that you have. That's, that seems reasonable and fair. Okay, all right. Are there any other questions, you know, dot our I's, cross our T's for Carolyn about these, the ordinances for cha the changes that we saw? Um, I just also wanted to circle back. There was a question from um, about whether it's appropriate to define what a zero lot line single family home is. Um, I, um, it's already defined in the zoning. There's no crossing of those definitions. Um, we're talking about two families or two units per lot versus a single family home. Um, so I just wanted to um, just circle back to that and clarify. That was the uh, correspondence from Mr. Ryan? Uh, yes. And, uh, sorry. Councilor Sharon. Go on, Rachel. Oh, excuse me. Um, oh, sorry. No, I, oh, Councilor Sharon. You. It's, it's, no, it's your, it's your turn, Rachel. I'm sorry. My, my, my screen was frozen for a second there, so I got confused about whose order. Uh, but so Carolyn, um, in, in the letter, uh, Mr. Ryan was asking, you know, what, what's, what's the downside of a, a, basically, if it is redundant to clarify that, if, could you uh, just speak to that? Um, yeah, I mean, we, it's clear that there's a, um, well, first of all, there's, there's, um, I think a misunderstanding of the zero lot line, um, but a zero lot line is for a single family home. So the package in front of you is for two families. So um, uh, there were some other um, questions about whether or not the zero lot line had been used. It's not relevant to this ordinance, whether it had been used um, appropriately or ex ex exploited, um, that we certainly don't find that the case at all. Um, all the units that have been built under that have been, you know, met the intent and the legal requirements. But again, those are for single family homes, so they wouldn't be able to add a second unit under this provision because they meet, they have different setback requirements. Thank you and apologies to the planning board. It's your time to ask questions. I just wanted to clarify that before we moved on, sorry. I just don't want you to leave us. <laughs> it's all good. Um, We're a great company, we know, we know. Carolyn, one last time, you did a good job about describing the uh, site plan review and what things then come under the planning board's purview. One more time so I can explain to my neighbors, in, this or in, this, in these zoning ordinances, what triggers site plan review? Any construction of a two-family home in these districts or any two single-family homes on a given lot, correct? Um, uh, so correct, except it's not in all of these districts because in U, R, B, and C, two families are already allowed by right unless you're building more than a 2,000 square foot addition of a two family home or a brand new two family that's going to exceed 2,000 square feet because we have a general provision throughout the entire that, are, that affects any kind of construction except for single family home. Um, that triggers site plan review for anything that's over 2,000 square feet. So in the package in front of you, because um, two families not allowed currently in A, URA, RR, SR, water supply protection, um, any new two family or two single families on a lot would trigger site plan review from the planning board. And and this, and then there's no change to the status of two families in B and C because it's already allowed by right, except then there's site plan only when you hit 2,000 square feet of construction. Thank you. Krista has her hand up. All right, Carolyn, I can't get the hand to go up on the computer. And I know you and I have been back and forth on email uh, this week. Can you just tell me again, this fossil fuel free heating system that you say is required that um, on these units that are triggered by site plan, mm -hmm. those are 
what zones and why just those zones if we're going this route and down this rabbit hole in my opinion so um fossil fuel free heating system so for your for you know the heat supply for the house um, would be anything other than propane gas or oil um, kind of um, run system um, would be required in every district um, because it's required at the point that site plan is triggered. So it does, so automatically it's gonna be for two families in URA, SRRR, water supply protection. And then on top of that, it would be triggered in URB and C when you're adding a second unit that's gonna result in more than 2000 square feet of construction or you're building a brand new of 2000 or more construction. But if you were in a two family in those two districts that didn't require coming to the planning board for anything, then you wouldn't hit that trigger. That, that paragraph wouldn't apply to you. And that's because um, because the t dictating the type of heating system starts um, getting into this gray area that is controlled by the building code and um, zoning can't, for by right uses, zoning can't dictate, you know, what materials, whether they're, you know, you use hardy plank or wood clapboard or vinyl siding or, you know, vinyl windows. Those are all building code um, jurisdictional items. And so unless there's some additional requests that you're seeking, we, um, uh, the zoning can't um, tell you what the building code already sort of has rules about. And, and this, Chris, if I might, just gets to what uh, Councillor Dwight was talking about, the resiliency plan, how this new zoning kind of overlaps and impacts with the resiliency plan and our hope to get the carbon neutrality by 2050. Yeah. Right, and that's the whole, I mean, that I think is the crux of the reason why we're recommending putting everything into site plan, because we feel like, you know, once you install a heating system, as you all know, <laughs> figure out that that's going to be with you for decades. And so if someone opts for, you know, a natural gas furnace, that furnace is going to be there for, you know, 20 years. And then even when it gets replaced, it's likely it'll be replaced with something else like that. So this is the time to really say, okay, with new units, we really need to start pushing the envelope. And, and, and if we can only do that through site plan, we feel like that's an important um, step to take, even though it adds another burden for someone trying to build a two family to Jana's point about how now we're doing site plan and that creates another sort of barrier. Um, we've talked briefly and this is not part of this conversation but maybe there's another way to do sort of a site plan light in the future that makes it a little bit simpler um, for these two family situations. But at this point we feel like addressing the fossil fuel or carbon reduction um, requirements is really important. Yeah, the, yep, I agree. I, I'm not saying it's not um, with well intention, but as you know, you and I have discussed over the last week that yeah. I've done an extensive amount of research in the last several weeks since our last meeting. And as the two options that I see, which are mini splits or groundwater source heating systems, I've been told by multiple installers and suppliers that mini splits are not going to be sufficient for anybody as a full heating primary system in the dead of winter. The other system, that groundwater system that Jonathan Wright puts into a lot of his $700,000 homes, when I called and got an inquiry on that, they said the minimum install is $35,000. It's just an expensive undertaking. And yeah. so I just, that's where I'm that's where I get caught up is like, we're adding layers and then we're adding layers that are really expensive. And one of those layers is probably very sufficient that groundwater heat source is probably very sufficient 
but I haven't been told by anybody that installs them or sells them that mini splits are going to be great for anybody in really cold weather that is extensive, the Februarys, the cold Januarys. So I'm concerned about that. I just want, I just, I haven't been sold clearly on that. And not because I don't think going fossil fuel free is down the road important. I agree it's important. I'm not fighting that. I just don't know if right now dictating that with the technology that we have at the price point that we have is the right time. That's all I have to say about that. Can we, can we phase it in? I don't know. I, it would be great to give some kind of an option to phase it in later. I mean, because Carolyn right now smiles weekly. <laughs> I know it's just, it's, I don't like talking to a black square. <laughs> Sorry. I, I oh. thought I had my, my, you had your picture on, you, on. Did. <laughs> you did. Um, I don't like talking to a, um, an, in, uh, a suit that's not moving. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I forgot that my camera wasn't on. Yeah, no, that, I think so. I think the way to do it is to say, um, I mean, you. I suppose you could put a date that that paragraph applies, or you could just you could. I mean, I wouldn't recommend this, but the other alternative is to strike that paragraph. I don't know if there's, you know, um, I don't. I think the phasing becomes more complicated because um, I mean we've we have done that on other ordinances. Um, you know, you could say, I guess January one, twenty, whatever the number, the, whatever the year is, this becomes applicable. I don't know what that does for you, but uh, I mean the, the issue is though is systems are going in now. And they're going to be there for 15 years. So do you want to do it now or do you want to do it in 15 years? Well, I want the energy efficiency now, but if it comes at a cost that we can't, I mean, I just think of like Governor Baker vetoing two years of hammering out climate bill legislation based on, on costs, you know, and I, I just, I, I worry that if we you know, I mean, this is getting into the weeds, but it does seem to be sort of one provision that at least right now, the aspiration is doesn't, you know, I'm persuaded by what Krista tells us from her experience as a builder that right now the aspiration doesn't meet the technology that's available that that, that builders and homeowners are going to want and need in their homes. I, I mean, I think, well, oh, I'm not... The chair, so I'll let Bill speak, but I, ha I had another sort of round of filling in the gaps. Well, and Bill, you're on the Energy Commission, so it might be- Well, I was, I was. And um, and Chris is right, absolutely. I, in fact, uh, many splits lose their efficiency when temperature drops below 14 degrees, you can't heat an average home. But they're done, the idea is to do it in combination with super insulation or net zero type of conservation systems and that goes beyond the stretch code, obviously. It would push beyond the stretch code. Although, um, and and uh, water source, ground source, water source heat pumps, you're absolutely right, will work, will do the trick, but their upfront costs are, are pretty exorbitant and challenging and would add considerable, uh, uh, a considerable price on, on any properties listed. As would conserva add conservation energy efficiencies would as well, but the it's when you do a HERS rating, for instance, it's not just the heating system. You're analyzing the level of insulation, the the air quality. All of those systems are all part of it. <coughs> so many splits don't. For a lot of older homes, I have many splits installed in my house after I got it reinsulated. Um, they do what I needed to do in the summer and they do, and they augment the heat that I have, but I do, I have a gas furnace. You're wearing a hoodie. Feel, right, well, I'm sitting in my little cabin right now, but in, but the in my house is not built to t today's standards and nor is it energy efficient by any uh, reckoning to today's standards, even according to the stretch code. So any new building 
would have stricter standards. I don't know if that actually offset, offsets the challenges that, uh, that mini splits air source heat pumps present. But I, I take everyone's point. I mean, um, that is, as Jenna has said, it adds a significant cost in assessment by anyone developing these properties. <laughs> if it's the homeowner, if it's a speculator, the same thing. So has the planning in. department done any calculations to um, determine the additional costs that'll be added to, the, to building a house? I mean, by having a mini split as opposed to a furnace? Well, I mean, well between that, no, and, and adding additional insulation uh, over and above the stretch code to allow the mini split to heat the house in the winter? Well, I, um, it almost doesn't matter because any new structure has to comply with the stretch code. No, I understand. Was, I'm, no, I'm saying over and above the stretch code. Um, not over and above the stretch code, but the, the point is, I guess, these mini, you know, the mini splits that are going in as retrofits or add, you know, add-ons to people's existing homes are not functioning the same way and not providing the same sort of um, um, heat that would be um, um, found in brand new construction. So it's not, it's hard to compare that, but um, so we're talking about brand new construction in that new construction in which you're going to have to meet the stretch code for you know, insulation and, and um, all these other factors are gonna, it's going to, the installation of a, of a system like a mini split is gonna function differently in that situation. Do we know that? We, we know that the cost of a net zero house is pretty high. Really high. Uh, yeah. And um, we're still talking that, that, about that, trying, to, trying to promote housing that people can afford. Well, but this ordinance isn't saying you have to do net zero. Right. But, but you still need to meet the building code, which is the stretch code. And that necessarily is much tighter building envelope than any existing house in Northampton that was built before, you know, eight years ago or whatever. And if I may, part of the calculus of a net zero house is no subsequent bills. I mean, you would pay it down over a period of time of ownership. It's not unlike a, an amortized house, but so, but on the cost benefit analysis, you know, you don't see a lot of people rushing to it because there's no, uh, uh, there are no codes requiring it. There is no, but you know, I, I the this is this is the this is the challenge. Of the needles that I was talking about threading, trying to maintain affordability, still abiding and subscribing to the resiliency plan, and acknowledging and recognizing the impact of of climate change, and and the associated cost that comes to the city also comes with associated costs and impacts on affordability. It is challenging. And um, it's going to figure into every conversation we have and every type of zoning that we change. If we had no zoning at all, these issues would still stand. So the fact is, is that um, we address it with what we're allowed to address it with within the means that we can address it. I think Just we need to, to put it out there. Sorry, Krista. Oh no, go. I've already said it. You go. Most yeah, you know. I think we need to put it out there. What Chris is saying, you know, 100% true. Um, we need to set the bar. We have some aggressive goals for resiliency. And, um, you know, as a builder, um, I, I also know that if you put it out there, then the builder is going to have to really think about it before they come in to see the planning board. And it is going to push the needle. You know, this is the way many communities are going, the earth is going, um, you know, the manufacturers are working on getting these things better. Um, I think if you don't put it out there, or if you say you're gonna phase it in by a certain time, that's a little arbitrary because we don't know what's around the corner with the next release for Mitsubishi or Fujitsu or whatever. Um, so I think it's important that if we're committed to this this goal, this aggressive goal that we put 
stuff like that out there uh, into the community and, and at least have pe people have a conversation about it. And we talk about it when they bring it to us. I just want to throw it out. I think putting aside, it's a really complicated question. And as a building professional, I think it's incredibly confusing to put this in zoning. It's not the function of zoning as it's commonly understood by anyone in the building world. Um, there's a good reason, I mean, there's a good reason to do it on a state level in terms of the amount of research that can be done by a planning staff of any city, even you know the biggest places, but certainly uh, to, to think of all the second and third order implications of, of some, what something like this will do, you know, none of the people who are building houses in, are just building in Northampton. They're building in all these other places. And I think it's an incredibly confusing thing to do this on a city by city basis. I, I think it's a bad idea. I'm not saying it's a bad idea for the world. I'm saying it's a bad idea to do it piecemeal and in a zoning ordinance. It makes no sense to me. Unfortunately, <laughs> when the state doesn't step up, and as Marissa said, well, well why don't uh, we put it? Why don't we say like, if you buy a house in Northampton, your parents aren't allowed to fight. I mean, it just there's a lot of things that the world should be. It just it's not necessarily should be in zoning. Like, let's put well, it in the energy I, code. I I'm sorry, I think that's kind of a false comparison. But, no, but zoning think, is not. There's an energy code, and there's a there's a building code, and these things I, like different rules are supposed to be in different places. It's really confusing I, to put one in the other. I I agree, and I don't. And the fact is that zoning actually is within the parameters allowed by law, are essentially the expression of a community about its objectives, ideals, and aspirations, and what they want their community to be. Um, therein lies it's. It, when in this case we are saying we do not want any more buildings to come online that will contribute that will actually reverse the intent of our resiliency plan we're we're not we're going beyond this eventually we're going to actually start you know trying to figure out and calculate we can't do it by zoning but calculating how we can uh, retrofit so but now as a preemptory we can embed this in and it's rather, you know, it's it's not, it is, as you point out, the zoning actually can limit it, but that state established zoning, um, we've accepted the stretch code. And in fact, actually, we will adjust and accommodate every standard that is the strictest standard applicable. And then in places that we can go beyond, we will go beyond, or we have, at least that has been the will of this council that's been expressed before. I don't have any, I, listen, I, I think the problems presented by Krista are spot on. I agree. I, and, and I know that from personal experience. And I actually even appreciate the fact that uh, uh, you feel that it's, it's an inappropriate place to put this. But we have no other mechanism or device by which we can actually impose this. And I think this, this puts an exclamation point on the fact that we are committed to to carbon neutrality of 2050, which, you know, if we're being really realistic, given the antique structure and, and heating systems that we already have in the city, it's gonna be very, very difficult to achieve. We also have to realize too, Council Dwight, that if you can't, if you build a new home and for whatever reason you can't put solar on it and you are, and you have to use this type of a heating source, you are drawing off the grid and it's my understanding that national grid is not exactly doing hydro fuel they are still doing fossil fuel so it's that's the other sticky thing for me i'm thinking like eh, like i get it but you're still well, to that point to that point chris you're absolutely right well first of all you can actually buy into um uh cooperatives for supplying and the thing is is that we are also working in community aggregation of electricity that will all be green sourced. We haven't hit it, we haven't achieved right. it yet, but again, that's the objective. And that, that, so everything that will come off the grid that's supplied to citizens of Northampton will be, will be uh, green source energy, it will not that's be good. fossil fuel based. But it's yeah. not the case now. I don't wanna, I don't wanna blow smoke up anyone. I don't, I, I'm not delusional, but the fact is, is that, and, and I think this is to Melissa's point, 
We're not going to get there unless we start insisting that we get there, unless we start laying down requirements and demands. Um, right. It's not going to be ideal. It is, and, and by the way, this in some level might give Alan some comfort because this is <laughs> an impediment to to uh, this mad rush of developers coming and paving over Northampton and building supersized McMansion. This is, we are, it's not, it's not an open arms invitation. It does impact affordability. That's the biggest problem. And that's the inequity that's built into trying to achieve carbon neutrality. It, it, is, it is not socially just because the people who suffer the most as a result of carbon, uh, as climate change, are also the people that can least afford the, the, uh, the alterations and accommodations that we need to make in order to try and adjust our, our behavior. I, it's a dilemma we live and work with and we're struggling with, but I, and this is part of the struggle, but I don't think it's counterproductive in that respect. I think this actually serves in a small way, not even a big way. I think it's a small way. This is actually a step in the right direction. Well, at least we ought to be clear that if we adopt this, there will be a certain amount of housing that will not get built because it will be impossible. So we'll talk about impediments to building or layers of regulation. This is imposing something that we, we're not even sure is technologically possible and it seems irresponsible to adopt it, not knowing that. Um, and, and if it turns out to not be possible, it's still a law and people will just not be able to build. I think it's well, it crazy is, to adopt it. Well, I'm sorry, it is technologically possible. It's a question whether it's technologically feasible, I think. And then, and and therein, I do. Well, that same yeah. difference to the developer who wants to build or the homeowner wants to build today. I mean, it, it, I, I, I mean, I'm, I am, I, I disagree that we have no other places to do this. I think to David's point, this may not be the place, but we collectively, whether as this organization or as individuals or citizens of Massachusetts, of the Commonwealth or of the United States, like, I mean, it is a bigger problem than us and certainly individually. I, 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 I don't, I tend to think that, that, that this is something that could come as a surprise to people who, you know, have a plan and otherwise would be able to go forward with something and, and then find out that, um, as you, to use your word, Bill, it's not feasible. Um, because of, of this constraint, I am all for it. I am in terms of like, what the goal is and wanting people to do this. And I also am somewhat persuaded that, that the, the argument that like mini splits, like putting a mini split in my house, um, uh, isn't gonna, you know, couldn't possibly heat my house, but a, a new house that's, you know, built to, to different specifications and, you know, it is, is gonna fare better, but if it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, um, and, and but we do have examples. We do have examples of housing that's been built with, I mean, that's, this is basically Jonathan Wright is building only houses with mini splits. Yes, I think most of them are net zero now. Habitat has done a couple of them. Um, so it's not that it's not um, possible. Um, and I mean, I guess don't I just wonder that a number of the, well, uh, sorry, Carolyn, I just, it does seem like, you know, Habitat for house, uh, for Humanity and other, I mean, it's almost like, you know, by definitionally, like truly policy-wise affordable housing that have some built-in subsidies and grants, like they, they, they can build these things. It's not, I think those kinds of developments will get built that way because it's aspirational for everybody involved. And that's how they, that's how they're going to get the money to build that Habitat for Humanity house. It's the... It's the, uh, uh, you know, s smaller developments. It's, the it's, it's exactly the kind of building that we're trying to encourage with the zoning change that I think would suffer in the short term. I am confident, actually, that the technology is going to come along rapidly. So there's a part of me, I mean, I get what you're saying, that like, like maybe, you know, phasing it in seems kind of ridiculous. But I mean, at the pace things are moving, 
even in two years, it could be sort of dramatically different in terms of what's available or the capabilities of mini splits or um, the affordability of the geothermal stuff. I mean, there's a lot of progress that's being made and it's being made quickly and arguably none of it's fast enough, but I don't think we can fix that by doing something that's going to stymie the purpose of, of this, this whole thing that we're, is under consideration. And I mean, maybe in the long term it won't, but in the short term, I think it will. Have we asked the attorney general's office about this? Because a very similar thing just got struck down in Brookline. And basically the only difference between that and us is number one, we're proposing it as sort of kind of a bonus. Like you could do a two family as a bonus if you do fossil fuel free. And the other difference is that it applies to town bylaws, not to city ordinances. So, I mean, it seems to me it's some of a moot point because as I read it, it's going to get struck down immediately because it's been pretty clear in the, in the precedent that it's it's the plumbing code regulates this stuff not zoning so this, the state will just knock it down so i mean if we want to you know pay lawyers to figure that out for us i i would just get it straight with the attorney general's office first well let me just clarify that's the difference is the attorney generals um have to approve town bylaws um when you're a city um and you adopt ordinances it doesn't go to the attorney general um and the city solicitor has looked at this ordinance, looked at it before, actually, it, we modified it to do the, um, have it site plan review. Um, so, and the, there's the next um, couple of ordinances coming through have the same language in it um, that the city solicitor has, has um, reviewed. Isn't it, can't we just amend this when the technology has come down in price? I mean, it, it, if it doesn't happen now, what happens like Marissa was saying, if in one, two, three years, pricing of ground source heat, you know, becomes more of a demand, therefore they're lowering their prices, the air heat pumps, the mini splits. I mean, I still haven't, you have not when I reached out to all the builders that I have relationships with and I talked about a brand new build to the stretch code. None of them thought that they could confidently put it in and feel confident that in the dead of winter, that their mini splits wouldn't just exhaust out and push out 50 degree heat. And then secondarily to that, they all, and Carolyn already said that it's fine legally, but they all said the same thing. Can they even legally do that? Like, we have to follow the stretch code. The stretch code's national. There's things in place, like if we can meet a certain um, zone for energy code, why can they tell us that we can't use a specific heat source? I couldn't answer any of those questions for them. I was specifically looking at, can a heat pump that's a mini split keep a family, a person, a single, whoever comfortable right now in February, where it's probably 11 degrees outside in a stretch code home, none of them felt comfortable with that, that they could, that they could say that it would do it. And they all said the same thing. Secondarily, we would hook it up to propane just to offset the cost of electricity because it would be outrageous unless you could do a net zero home. And then if you get to a net zero home again, your your Jonathan Wright's seven hundred and forty five thousand dollar homes, which is fine because they're needed. Obviously, we're selling them. But Krista, did did any of them speak about supplemental heat? Because sometimes what we do is, you know, these houses are so tight now, and you've got your mini splits, and they're going to take care of you, except for those most dire time frames, like right now. So we'll, you know stub out or, or uh, allow for a piece of supplemental, um, you know, baseboard heating, if it's needed underneath a bank of windows. Um, and then if, if the system can't provide, you know, to come in and install some, some supplemental heat underneath that as a sort yeah. of a stopgap between here and there. Right. And most, most of them said that they said, well, can you can't you just supplement it with propane to help offset the cost of what the electricity is going to cost? And I said, no, it's no propane. Pretend you're building this house electric only. You and can most of them said, electrical you, baseboard, you know. 
Yeah, they both, they, you know, most of them said, I guess you'd throw an electric baseboard heater in, but, you know, I mean, and again, I talked to developers that have large crews I and to down to five guy crews to 12 guy crews to 50 guy crews, you know, so I tried to hit a range because everybody has their sweet spot. Everybody, every builder has what they like to build and what they're comfortable building. And so, yeah, I mean, they were saying, I, yeah, I guess you'd throw an electric baseboard heater in, you know, one of the guys that builds um, that he was saying that his hers Raiders constantly trying to push him into putting the mini splits in with the electric baseboard heaters to the interior bedrooms, you know, and, and he said, I guess I could do that. It just seems like, why am I going to put electric baseboard heating in and add all these different elements when I can put in a high efficiency furnace that burns at whatever, 97% and is going to be less money than mini splits and all these different heads and then electric baseboard heating. He says, I don't, I just don't, he, you know, that one built, both those builders were just kind of like, eh, I guess we could do it. Well, you know, I mean, when you put it out there, you know, when it's out there, then they have to do more than say, yeah, you know, they, they have to just do it, you know, if and I may, then I, we start to get there. I actually have a house in Hollywood that I go to that I've been COVID retreating to and uh, when it suits me, built it. My son built a timber frame structure with only four inches of foam insulation in it uh, with one mini split and augmented electric heat. Um, to offset when it's dropped below zero. It's all paid for by the solar panels that are on the roof. And oh. in fact, actually, there's a surplus. He's actually subsidizing electricity in the rental properties he has here in town. It's not impossible. I mean, it's, it's, it's not clearly ideal, but it is possible. And, and the upfront costs were not really outrageous. So it is doable. So I don't understand why... It, I'd understand why a builder would be reluctant to say, well, here, here's your electric baseboards. We're trying to get rid of that crap, but we, and then throw in, uh, throw in your mini splits. You got these cassettes on your walls, you know, whatever, but you know, give you air conditioning and heat. And, and you're right. If you don't have solar, it's not, it's it, in the end, that's much more expensive. If you don't, if you're not a lot, if you don't have solar on your property or that you're using, or if you're not part of a, 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 a consortium or cooperative, then yeah, it's, it, I, I absolutely understand. I, the thing is, is I, it, it's to the degree that it makes it impossible for people to do, which would be silly for us to do. If this is, if we're just, you know, there's aspirational rules and if we make those and it just absolutely eliminates any prospect of anyone building, then that wouldn't be right. I agree, but I don't think that's the case. And I think a, a, a phasing it in and trying to figure out when it's affordable, when the cost benefit analysis meets with the, the consensus of developers, do they send us a note and let us know we can change the rule at that point? That's unfortunately not how we develop laws. We're going to develop a law that um, the proof will be in the pudding. In a year's time, if it's so restrictive and that there's absolutely no one taking out plans because of this, then that's the point of you you go back and you review and say all right this is this is failing us um what do, what do we do to accommodate it but at this point you know to a, melissa's original point if you, if you if we don't create these conditions and terms and desire and express our desires through that then um we keep punting on this. We will punt over and over and over again on the on the resiliency plan and everything else. Every time, I mean, we had this fight over banning plastic uh, uh, disposable food containers. The same fight. It went on for a long time, and um, we achieved it. But there are pressures. There are consequences. There are costs associated with that that are particularly onerous given the uh, challenges that business owners face right now because of COVID. These are the things that we're weighing right now. I actually am very appreciative that actually Krista brought this up because this is one thing that gave me a little pause too. But at the same time, I still feel fairly confident that it's it's appropriate to advance it.
Krista, thank you very much for doing all that research and bringing this up. I've learned a lot too in the last 20 minutes or so. Um, <laughs> there's a lot in these nine um, pieces that we're looking to move forward to the city council. I don't know if this piece um, is a deal breaker for anybody. Um, I'm thinking it's probably more work than not to pull it out at this point. Um, it, similarly to, we could go back to the, uh, to the verse and thought of a straw, a uh, straw vote on this between planning board members. Um, but I would rather perhaps just move to a motion to recommend these um, zoning amendments with the caveat that we're not gonna be dealing with 20.169. So there'll be nine pieces. Um, is there anybody on a planning board would, that would like to raise other points that we haven't hit on? Is there a motion to be made then perhaps for a recommendation? Well, if we don't have a motion, then we're gonna to have to, as was earlier said, punt this down the road to some other night. Um, George, I'll make, a, I'll make a motion. I just wanna make sure I get the language right. I, I, am, I motion that we recommend um, nine out of 10 of these ordinances the way that you explained it um, to move forward. Yep. To the city council. So the okay. one that the one that we're pulling out is 20.169. And at this point, the motion is that there are no substantive edits to what was presented to us tonight. I second. Thank you, Janice. So Melissa made the motion, Janice seconded it. Any discussion? All right, then we'll go to a roll vote of the planning board members. Um, and I'm looking across my screen. I'll start with uh, David Whitehill. Yes. Uh, Melissa. Yes. Krista. No. Uh, Chris Tate. Yes. And Marissa. Yes. And Alan Verson. Sorry, Alan, no. you are muted. Sorry, no. Okay, and the chair, George, uh, votes yes. So we have two against, and what does that leave us? Six, four, Carolyn? I'm... I vote yes also. Oh, thank you, Jana. <laughs> I missed your black screen there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yep, so that's... Um... Six in favor and two opposed. Two opposed and no abstentions. Yeah. All right, this has been a great discussion and I'm sure we'll continue with legislative matters and then at the full city council when they um, work on it. Um, okay. So And we'll see there, at the next joint hearing that we're gonna have, so. Maybe we should take a motion to adjourn <laughs> our portion of the planning board meeting. I move, Someone, I move we adjourn. Second. Planning board meeting. All right, made by Marissa, seconded by David. Um, any discussion? All right, let's go. Let's go through that roll vote. David? Yep. Melissa? Yep. Krista? Yep. And Chris? Yes. And Marissa? Yep. Okay. And also Jana. Don't forget Jana. Don't forget Jana. <laughs> and Jana White? Uh, actually, my sound cut out. I don't know what I'm voting on, so I abstain. <laughs> okay, <laughs> to adjourn. adjourn. Me. <laughs> to oh, yeah, adjourn. Yeah. Yes, I vote yes. And Alan Verson. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much. This has been a treat, Legislative Matters. Thanks, Carolyn, for all your work on this. Too late, Jana. Thank you have to stay the rest now. of your night. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> you're you're a now. <laughs> thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Okay. All right. I missed them already. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I said, we're going to see them in a couple of weeks anyway, in a few weeks. Today. And there's more to come.
but yes, I, I actually agree. That's very, that's been a very instructive conversation. Um, what's your pleasure? We actually add, we have an addition to this uh, 20.182 and that's the ordinance relative to demolition review for historically significant buildings. Um, and you've heard some comments about that in the, um, in the public comment. Um, how do you, how would you like to proceed? I don't know, do you wanna discuss um, the, the package that was just uh, recommended by the planning board or do you wanna move on to that one item that we have not discussed yet at all? And that's, we have Sarah here to also help break it down yeah, for stuck around this whole time yeah good on you sarah and and council murphy is here as well so <laughs> um so and jackie's still here and alex Jarrett and marianne labarge and george is stuck around so i'm i'm, I'm touched so uh what's your pleasure I'm not sure uh, how many questions I don't have. I don't think I have lots of, you know, who knows, but, uh, you know, uh, involved questions before I'm ready to vote on the package. But I also, now that I see Sarah, I, <laughs> I'm fine if, if, if that would be better to take the other one first. I say well, we Sarah, take 20.182 yeah. first. Okay. Okay. Sarah, why don't you... Uh shape this for us, please. Oh, sorry, Sarah, hold on, hold on, hold on. There you go. Okay, there we go. Uh, so what's being presented as an ordinance change is, is actually pretty simple. It's basically just a cleanup of some things that no longer made sense. Um, but I'm happy to talk about anything that was brought up in public comment if you would like me to. Uh, so under, uh, 161.6, so it, uh, with the adoption of this chapter, it talked about how appointments are made to the historical commission. Uh, that, that's not an appropriate place for appointments to be in uh, with recent changes to the charter. Um, so this is all moved to the administrative section of the city code, so that doesn't belong here anymore. Um, in section B, just changing development to sustainability. And then section D, uh, that required the commission to create an inventory of significant buildings and structures built during 1901 to 1939 that would be subject to the ordinance. Um, but this is no longer applicable with the recent change last year to uh, a look back period up to 1945. So that's basically just removing something that, that doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, Sarah, I don't know, you, you were here for public comment, Jackie Balance's concerns yep. about, uh, was, about yeah. notification. Okay. Can you speak to that? Uh, sure. Um, so zoning ordinances, for example, require uh, under the, the state enabling legislation, abutters within 300 feet to be notified of certain types of activities for special permits and variances. So that, that doesn't apply to demolition. Uh, demolition is not a zoning ordinance. It's a it's a general city ordinance, and it, it doesn't have that that state enabling legislation requirement. And when the demolition ordinance was initially passed, it it was really important for people to understand that they they wouldn't have to pay any additional fees, and that if their their property wasn't subject to a delay or a public hearing, that they wouldn't have any additional um, delays on their 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 projects. So. The vast majority of properties that are um, reviewed under the demolition ordinance don't have a delay and aren't even declared um, significant. So it's a two-step process. The first is declaring something significant, at which point a public hearing is tripped. Uh, then we would put a, a yellow public notice sign out, um, post the notice in City Hall and online for two weeks prior to the hearing. Um, but unless that happens, we're you know we're we're not notifying people there we don't currently have a, a fee for demolition this is just under the, the building code um, so currently how it works is people will apply for a demolition permit most people don't even know that it's being reviewed by the historical commission the historical commission will take a look at it and say you know is this significant or not most of them are not significant 
Uh, and then again, if it is, we'll have a public hearing. Um, but because there, there's no fee and there's no separate application to the planning department, uh, we're, not, we're not doing an, any additional notification. And that's something that we could certainly look at in the future. We are pursuing CPA funds this upcoming round for a historic preservation plan and the demolition ordinance as well as local historic districts and potential other tools that we could utilize to um, protect the city's historic resources will all be part of that. But you know, we haven't done that at this point. The demolition ordinance is sort of a standalone. I think then, yeah, I don't think that's a terrible idea reviewing the demolition ordinance, particularly as far as notifying. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's disruptive to a neighborhood, obviously. Uh, it's a significant destruction project that would actually might at least it, it wouldn't, I wouldn't be adverse to a butters knowing what they're in for. Although um, I think, you know, in some cases people would want, it, it would want notification perhaps to resist or to protest it, I don't know. But the fact remains that um, to wake up one morning with a large construction crew outside your house and suddenly uh, demolishing a house might, I, I can understand and appreciate that that might be disturbing. But. Councilor Shara. Um, but Sarah, did you say that there is a notice that is posted outside of whatever is being demolished for a certain amount of time? Yes, so if a, if a public hearing is required after the Historical Commission has, has determined that a building meet the ignition, met the initial significance step, then we post the, the same public notice yellow sign that goes out for any uh, zoning or conservation commission hearing. Okay, so only, but if that isn't, needed or triggered, then there's no notice. Correct. So it's it would basically just be the same as a as a building review. Okay. And people can also sign up online to receive all of the notices for the historical commission and and any other city committee. So you can select whatever is of interest to you and, and have those sent right to your inbox. Other questions? Uh, Carolyn. Sorry, I just I thought, it, I don't know if this would be helpful at all, but in addition, um, you know, there are many structures that just go for demolition to the building department. It's part of a building permit review. They don't even, you know, they might have been built in 1960 or 1970. Um, that goes straight to demolition, you know, so that no building permits are ever um, you know, sent out for, for a butter notice um, either. So that's sort of um, consistent with how we treat that first level of review for um, buildings that are older than 1945 that the Historical Commission subcommittee has to look at to see if it even rises to the level of a public hearing. Uh Council Maori. All right, so I, I have no you know, issue with this, uh, uh, the, the amendment, to the, the, um, the amendments to this ordinance, but I do, I do have, you know, I do feel like abutters deserve to be notified and if it's not built into the system, I mean, I guess the, what, what is the downside to uh, notifying abutters? We don't have the system for it. If, 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 a, if there's no trigger for a public hearing and I, I suppose some cost, but I, I, I'm inclined to just, uh, I would like to find a way to um, make that in if we can on some level, because it seems reasonable. I do, I do have the question that what, what point do you notify a butters as Councilor Dwight said, would they really just wanna know before it was discussed and so they can give a uh, public comment or is it enough to, you know, when the decision's made for it to be, for, for a butters to be notified? Yeah, I'm, so so this is the state's model demolition review ordinance. Um, so it, it doesn't carry any requirements for a butter notification. Uh, again, there, there's no fee structure built into that currently. So if we if we did want to do that, um, you know, and hopefully this would be a discussion that would come out of our upcoming preservation plan process. But we we would have to look at how to administratively make that work. And um, currently, we we couldn't require an a butter notification with no no application and no mechanism to pay for it. 
there's the rub. We can't we can't subsidize it, and we can't require it to be subsidized because we can't build into a, this a fee schedule as an amendment that's separate and the. <clears throat> it would be appropriate to do it under the demolition ordinance if that comes up for review and discussion and comes before us. Sarah, did you say at one point it, it used to be required to, what was the system in place that used to uh, alert abutters or was it? Uh, no, so for demolition, there there isn't one. There, was, um, there never was. Is, uh, no, oh, okay. the, no. I thought so, maybe it had existed and then had changed. No, and part of the discussion when the ordinance was uh, initially approved was that, you know, historic resources aren't just um, important to the neighborhood, but they're important to the city in general. So it, it didn't make sense at that time to uh, place additional importance just for neighborhoods, that everyone should be involved. Um, but it, that's certainly something that could be looked at, but it, it would need a, a much broader look than, um, than just throwing them into the ordinance without a, a mechanism in which to do it. Mm. Other questions for Sarah? Councilor Thorpe? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sarah. And you mentioned earlier about um, people can sign up to uh, be notified. What site do they go to to get this, to sign up? Uh, so that it's all on the, the city website. So if you go to the, um, the calendar, I'm trying to do it now, but if you go to the city calendar, um, you can you sign to up. create an account, them. correct, Sarah? I think you have to create an account. Yeah, uh, right. I think you do. But you can sign up for, you know, like I, I signed up for legislative matters notifications uh, when, when this ordinance right. got referred. So or you could you can pick from the, the whole host of city boards and committees that interest you and, and get notifications as soon as those agendas are published. I do okay. have concerns so that those who, oh, excuse me, Councilor Thorpe, it's getting late. I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. <laughs> Both on the boards and committees? Sarah, it's, it's under Civic oh, Plus. That? Civic, is it? Yes, yeah, it's Civic Plus. Thank so you. So the, the city website. So people out there know. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, if you go to the city website, it's uh, Civic Plus is the host, and you can go to settings, and you can subscribe. And uh, as Council Mayor said, you you leave your name and address. Uh, you can have it texted to you. I unfortunately signed up for any number of things, so I get thousands of emails and thousands of texts notifying me of fire responses, snow emergencies, everything else. But that's available. It's actually, there's a huge list of things that you can choose from that you'll get either text, uh, email, and I think, yeah, I think that's it. Not a reverse 911, but yeah. I mean, I just have that's concerns about our older residents who don't, you know, aren't gonna go to a website and register or get texts. And I, I mean, I don't know if they, how they're usually alerted um, as a butters, is it in the paper? I don't really know. I guess I would have to ask those who don't use the website, but I do. I, I mean, I do have concerns about abutters not being notified. I, I don't want to hold up the this ordinance, but um, I, well, and I don't know if there's any language we can put in, uh, you know, to add to it that you know that could show an intention to to look into the situation of you know how to alert abutters. Well, actually, uh, just by telling Sarah is probably the best way to go. Um, embedding it, the language in basically making this is an ordinance, it's a law, right. so it's actually gotcha. requires something. And insofar as, as Sarah points out, there's no mechanism by which we could actually enforce this. Abutters are traditionally notified with cards, depending on, you know, they're sent a postcard. But also, as Sarah pointed out that, and Councilor Sherab said as well, is the um, at certain projects will trigger placement of a yellow sign on the lawn. Um, so people passing by, although that's less so these days, hopefully soon again, people will be wandering by walking freely or driving freely. But so, but yeah, I don't, there's no way we can fold it into the language here, but I think Sarah certainly understood and heard, and I don't, I don't hear her pushing back against it. I, I, I think that, that uh, she would, um, right. she, she's heard what we want. Yeah, I mean, it's more that uh, with with zoning and, and conservation permits, we have a state law that, that guides or actually requires the the uh, abutter distance notification. So if, if someone is applying for a conservation commission notice of intent, 
or a planning board special permit, we know exactly who we need to notify. We would have to determine what would be appropriate in this case and then figure out a fee structure that would make sense in a way not to make it too onerous for applicants. Well, I, I guess um, if, if, if Sarah has that as a kind of a, a intention to look into, um, I would also say that as a ward counselor, I could get the alerts and then try to reach out to, you know, if it's, some, it was, for example, in my ward, I would could send for what it's worth uh, my own alert, you know, newsletter um, and try to help that process. So I don't want to hold up this ordinance, but I'm glad we're all thinking about how to do this. I hear a lot from residents about not being notified about this or that. So I'm, I'm interested in the whole, you know, how do, how do you really effectively let people know things? That's not part of this, but, I, but thank you, Sarah, for, for, being, for being willing to do that. Um, any other questions? Sarah, I think uh, I think we've exhausted you here, and, uh, and I appreciate your time. I, I do. Sure. Um, thank you. Unless you want to talk about mini splits, because then you, you could stick around. <laughs> <laughs> well, to that point, actually, uh, Council Miori transitions us to uh, to the meat of the matter, which is. We now have uh, from the planning board a recommendation with, and, and actually in, we're in a unique circumstance to know exactly what the source of deliberation was, where the divisions were, where the concerns are. Um, uh, you guys, you wanna discuss that further, amplify, express your feelings regarding this? Council Maori. Just had um, actually just I just wanted to cover a little ground that we didn't and hopefully it won't be a lot but um, just one clarification is I never really understood what happens with septic like in lead you know ward six and ward seven we have septic in our well you know private uh, septic and well uh, so when this um, with this the two family by right I assume that means you kind of revamp you have to revamp the septic and the well or. Carolyn, that's a yeah. Carolyn. Yeah, I mean, anytime you add a bedroom, even if it's for your single family home, you have to go through the review process that it, yeah. through the, you know, building permit review process to make sure that your system can accommodate whatever addition you're doing to your home. Same thing would apply for adding, you know, however many, it's based on bedroom. So however many bedrooms this second unit might have. Yeah. Yeah, it's a separate review. Okay. So that's another sort of potential constraint, right? So yeah. in, um, not everyone can do that without expanding their septic. And then that's another cost. Yeah, that, that, that would be a constraint. Thank you. And then the other, the only other lingering thing I had was, um, like, you know, I had to work today and I, I read the, the emails late and I am not, I don't actually feel that clear about what What's going on with urban forestry's um, concerns? And it, it sounds like it sounds like almost like a misunderstanding. But I, I guess I'm not. Um, I, and you did speak to that. But if you had anything add, add because I didn't really, act, frankly, have time to to give. A, I, I read them very quickly. Uh, the urban forestry letter and your response. But um. yeah, I mean, I I think there are probably a few issues. Um, I think there was some confusion about um, what was what it um, had ch changed and transpired since the introduction of the ordinances. In that, there's still um, there is site plan. I think their main con the main goal is they want a lot of projects to go to site plan because that mm -hmm. automatically requires a review uh, of. Um, the tree replacement formula for trees that are coming down that are large trees, 20 inches or greater. Um, so uh, the other piece that I think I heard was, or read, um, uh, was that um, they wanted to make, I think there was a related to that consistency issue about language and who, you know, making sure that no matter what subsection um, re is referencing tree planting, that it be all sort of targeted back to that tree planting guideline. So that's that was an amendment um, that is in this latest version. Um, and uh, 
So other than that, I mean, I think I think they were opining that they wanted to be able to review all zoning ordinances that are coming forward um, and have them referred out, but that's not typical for what, um, what we do. And so, uh, but, I, but I think we still address the issue. Their primary concern seemed to be that they wanted to make sure that most of these came through site plan so that they would there would be a review of um, large trees that would be coming down. And of course that's on top of already that other provision in there about replacing, you know, much smaller trees that are taken right. down. Well, I, I would say at this point um, with that kind of lingering you know, question and my, my lingering concern about um, caps, I, you know, it's true that the number is random. Um, like, what, what Alan, uh, what member uh, Verson was um, talking about. I didn't feel comfortable with that number. I, I just can't really picture what that meant. So I don't really have an answer to the cap question. I, I just feel like these lingering concerns, I, I, I support um, I'll, I'll support this package of ordinances. And I feel like I'm kind of grateful that we have to go to council now and, and I can revisit those concerns and think about those concerns on the way. But I, you know, I plan to support this, uh, the package of ordinances and the demolition. Uh, and knowing that we get our, our um, think tank of our fellow counselors uh, to, to, to kind of revisit anything lingering like that. The, um, the issue of, of, I think that the urban, uh, the UTC had actually brought up, as you point out, was what they were concerned that a, a development by right circumvents the significant tree ordinance and their and subsequently their review uh, for qualification. So, um, and you just address that. And, and in fact, actually, as you said, most of these would be by right. I mean, most of these will trigger that level of review, particularly significant trees or 20 inch calipers. You were actually talking about even replacement of trees as small as three inch in caliper. Um, as to Councilor Maori's concern about the uh, carbon sequestration issue, um, the one of the things that I discovered in the process of being a counselor course, uh, uh, almost a third to half of the carbon sequestration occurs in the root ball and the root system, um, not just the tree. So that's why significant trees are more more important as for carbon sequestration purposes than the smaller caliper trees. But even then, every little bit helps. And um, yes, and then again, um, thereby lies another impediment to just wholesale citywide massive development of uh, second family homes. Uh, the, that would be and you, you know, I was, as we were discussing, and we're, you know, and this is an empirical observation, but I live in a workforce neighborhood that my, uh, and so does George, actually. Um, my house was built for the railroad workers who used to, uh, where stop and shop is now, where the switching yard was. Um, my house looked exactly like my neighbors. They all, we all have houses that all look roughly the same. We're all cheek by jowl. Um, and this is true of Council Shara as well. We were work of workforce housing. It's not that anymore. Um, the the house, a house that looks just like mine, two doors down, just sold for, uh, it was flirting with $500,000. <clears> and without any modifications or changes, that's not what I bought my house for. There was a five unit apartment. Um, half a block from me on, on uh, Finn Street um, that was demolished to make a third family home, a, a, a home, a third house for a family of two. It is huge, it covers the whole lot. Um, but he was allowed by right. He was uh, subsequently lost housing, rental housing for any, uh, you know, up to 12 people at least. So these are, you know, in as Council Murphy, who we won't we won't allow to speak, but he will attest that, that Northampton is not 
rife with teardowns and buildups like that. Those are, they're not, a, see, I remember the first one was on Barrett Place and it, it made the front page of the Gazette for, uh, <laughs> it was it was that big a deal. But we're not Greenwich, Connecticut in that respect. But we run the risk of that. And I, you know, I absolutely, you know, in fact, I haven't disagreed with a single argument that was held up against these. It was put up against this. I absolutely understand and recognize the the intrinsic problems and difficulties. And as you know, any change will prompt the unintended consequences issue. The objective here is to is noble and I think worth pursuing and staying with. I think that uh, we do have the opportunity to come back and modify as, as needed, as it's presented. I personally don't anticipate, as I said, uh, a land grab that will suddenly occur. That was what was, I remember a number of folks were worried about that when we changed the setback rules relative to ADUs. The, the, the concern with the neighborhoods were going to be completely demolished and, and density was the resistance to density was we were going to create a market system that was unachievable for most of us who live here and that the people's neighborhoods would be uh, distorted beyond recognition. Did not come to pass. It will not come to pass. Northampton is not the only garden spot on the planet here that is appealing to developers and all the other associated impediments that go with that. So what we're, we are trying to do is create a just and equitable system that also adheres to the strictures that we laid out in the uh, resiliency plan, which is aspirational, but it is critical. And I, think it should, as I said, it should inform every conversation we have and every law that we debate, particularly laws relative to zoning. So that's my last rant. Um, so uh, I don't know what your pleasure is. If uh, Are there any more questions or discussion points or anything? I, I don't want, I don't want to rush this. And if not, do you want to vote on a recommendation as a package? Do you want to separate them out? There is one that we're uh, eliminating uh, by request, but what's, I'll accept the motion. Move to approve the package of ordinances. As, as minus, positive, right, minus, oh, excuse me, yes, right. Minus as the amended. one. As, as, as amended. amended. Right, uh, for a positive recommendation to council. And Councilor Sarah, that's a second. Any discussion on those? Laura, please call the roll on the package. The first package is then when we get in, we'll then we'll do the uh, last item, which was the uh, demolition delay. Councilor Dwight. Councilor Dwight. Am I? Yes. Is anybody ringing? Yes. <laughs> um, yes. Councilor, uh, <laughs> yes. Councilor Maori. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. All right. Those pass with a positive recommendation to the council. Next item, I'll accept the motion on uh, item 20.182. This is the ordinance relevant to uh, demolition review for historically significant buildings. Move a positive recommendation. Second. Motions to make by Councilor Sheriff, seconded by Councilor Thorpe. Any discussion? Lord, do the honors, please. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Maori. Yes. And Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Well, that is the extent of our business. And uh, does anyone have any new business? No, I didn't think so. Does anyone have a final turn. motion? Okay, there's a motion by to adjourn by Councilor Shara. Second. A second. Second by okay. Councilor Maori. No, no, we don't debate that. So Laura, please call the roll. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Maori. Yes. And Councilor Thorpe. Yes.